Hello friends. Welcome to Muse Fanfiction. How are you all? So in this video, we are gonna talk about the part 2 of what if Naruto was the god of wild. The primordial. And before we start, if you want more amazing stuff like this, then be sure to subscribe to our channel, it's absolutely free for you, but it means a lot for us. And also if possible share this video with your friends. Now let's start. Naruto was in the pavilion with a tied-up Zoe secured to a barstool glaring at him. What is the meaning of this? She would shout, and Naruto would only look at her with a crazy grin. You don't know, so you must learn. Then, with a less-than-sane cackle, he would return to his cooking pot, giggling every now and then. Zoe was starting to seriously contemplate her safety with every little shiver that came over his shoulders at his smothered laughter. She tried escaping, but the more she tried, the tighter the bindings got. She tried cutting, burning, and breaking the rope, but it remained undamaged. She idly wondered what cursed materials were introduced during its creation, but resolved herself to the fate she would soon discover. He would not harm her under the pledge to her patron, she would survive this. After a few minutes, Naruto turned to her with a massive grin and stars in his eyes. In his hands, was a, bowl? Naruto set it down in front of her, and she was immediately hit with a strong smell of seasons and flavor. She didn't deny that it smelt good, but not to her particular liking. Naruto plopped down in front of her on the other side of the counter, and gave her a pair of chopsticks. She looked at him quizzically, and he only grinned. Behold Zoe, the true food of the gods, Naruto said with a dramatic wave of his hands and snap of chopsticks. She didn't look convinced. Naruto hurried over and undid the bonds on her hands, she tried to get free, but Naruto immediately stopped her efforts. Do not resist, you will appreciate my efforts after this, you will be awakened to the one true way. Naruto said strongly, his eyes no longer holding rationality. She looked past him and saw to her horror, the rest of the hunters. They were simply just watching, some were even looking at the bot in curiosity to see if there was more to go around. Help me. Zoe hissed, and Phoebe only shook her head sadly, it's okay, you will understand, it's the true way. Zoe turned to Naruto, snarling in partial anger and panic. Stop with the clones. Naruto smirked and prodded her forehead, which only increased her anger, I am not eating that. Naruto looked like he had been physically stabbed, and even staggered back a few paces. Zoe sprung free from his weakened grasp and hissed at him. Naruto actually fell to the ground and started tracing circles with his finger. But it's divine. He said childishly with a pout, continuing his circling. Zoe was agape at this display, before looking back at the bowl suspiciously and then back to the blonde. Is it poisoned? Naruto snapped to his feet, looking genuinely insulted, as if I would defile the food of the gods. Zoe honestly wasn't sure how to think about the male in front of her. He was strong, godly strong, and yet it he never loomed over anyone, only carried them higher. Even in their battle, his clones never did any real harm to them. He never touched them perversely when he had the chance, and even respected them enough to not hold back unrealistically. She slumped a little. Something she didn't do. She sighed, very well. I will try this, concoction, but in exchange. Naruto appeared in front of her with stars in his eyes, grabbing her hand and shaking it. Thank you thank you. You won't regret it. I surrendered the duel just so you could try it. She was shocked at that. He threw away a win for her to simply try this. She doubted it was hidden cowardice. What is ramen? She walked to the stool and sat down, before lifting the chopsticks and stabbing them into the broth. She picked up a few noodles and smelled them, looking for any source of toxins or poisons. Nope, only salty goodness. She sighed and with a prodding look from Naruto, she put it in her mouth. Flavor. A lot it. It was like a whole feast of meaty flavors with salt and seasonings in a bite. She stabbed for more and drank the broth, appreciative of the dish. Naruto watched with a smile, but felt his mood darken slightly as he remembered the true food of the gods, Ayame and Tuchi's ramen. Kami he wanted a bowl, or thirty. Zoe finished her bowl in around ten minutes, placing her chopsticks on the bowl and dabbing the corners of her mouth. I must confess, this dish wasn't bad but it still falls below ambrosia by a margin, she said, but when she looked at him, she was shocked to find him in his own little world. With a tear running down his cheek, Naruto, she called, and he snapped to his senses. 
he seemed to realize his situation and smiled at her brightly, a look ruined by his tear. He realized this a second later, and brushed it away with a sad smile. Zoe, I have a confession to make, this is my attempt at the food of the gods, it isn't really it, the real stuff comes from my home world, made by a father and daughter duo, my favorite people in my entire life. I'm sorry to say, that I will never be able to replicate their dishes, but I can say something with certainty. He regained his grin and pointed at himself victoriously, my ramen is three margins worse than theirs, and if it is only one margin behind ambrosia, then it is indeed supreme. He struck a victory pose, peace sign and all. Zoe only stared at him in befuddlement, before shaking her head and walking away. You're weird. Naruto wilted, but sighed and cleaned up his mess. Yeah yeah. Zoe walked to the rest of the hunters, warmth in her stomach and her mind lost in thought. Ayame and Tucci. Huh, perhaps from, wait, he said, home world, does that mean he isn't even supposed to exist here? Maybe that isn't why he is like the other males, because he truly isn't one of them. Lieutenant. Phoebe called, and Zoe flinched from her thoughts and looked up at them, determination in her eyes. Girls, we must win. Naruto walked back towards the clearing he left the girls in, noticing it was empty and he sighed, before calling out. I know you are there. Can you come out so we can start the hunt? If not I'm just going to wait, which is in my favor anyway as you have to catch me, he said, before sitting down on a flat space and sighing. A few seconds later, Zoe and Phoebe appeared, rope in their hands, well boy, ready to surrender? Naruto sighed, and here I thought we moved past that, it's Naruto, that's my name. I'm not, boy, or, male, or any other derogatory name. I have a name, use it. They looked at him curiously, before approaching him at fast speeds. Naruto rolled backwards and stood up, jumping back and landing with his back to a tree. We have an omission to make to the laurels. Zoe said, and Naruto frowned. What do you wish to add? Zoe smiled, should we win, I will lead the quest to save my lady. Naruto blinked, and then looked confused. I thought that was what we were going to do anyway, was there something I missed? Blink. What? Phoebe asked incredulously, her voice losing its harshness, you were going to let us lead. Naruto frowned. Why wouldn't I? I'm new to this world, I hardly know anything on the grand scheme of things, and any team I led would surely suffer. Zoe from what I understand is nearly 2000 years old, she has infinite more experience than I do on this world, and you trust her. Why wouldn't she lead when she is clearly the best candidate? Zoe shook her head, you said it again, this world. What do you mean? Were you originally not? Naruto's expression darkened. Yes, I am not. I haven't been in this world for more than what you call a year. That was a shocker. Phoebe looked less than believing. Where do you come from then? Hell? Naruto's lips curled into a small, cruel smile. Yeah, something like that. That was chilling. The vocal, cheerful blonde of sunshine wasn't there anymore. He was colder, darker, full of pain anger, and loneliness. He literally had a dark aura around him, before it suddenly vanished, and he looked back up at them with his usual smile. Are you sure you want to waste time like this? You have until sunrise, and you're dawdling. Zoe really wasn't sure what to think at this point, so she went with her gut feeling. You're weird. Naruto twitched, and his head cocked to the side. Yeah yeah, you said that earlier, anyway, was there something else you wanted to add? Phoebe stepped forward. I want the answer to three questions, with complete answers and honesty. Naruto frowned, that is a dangerous statement, may I know what the questions are on? You. My abilities. No, that surprised Naruto, looking at her in confusion, what could you possible want to know? You will find out at the end of the duel. Phoebe said, gripping the rope. Naruto held her gaze for a moment, before sighing. And if I win? I solemnly swear to never shoot you in the nuts. Naruto perked up at that. Tempting, hmm. I guess I will see when you ask your questions. Now come at me. The girls huffed at not getting an answer, and charged forward. A few sneaky hunters tried to get behind him, but let out startled cries as the tree Naruto was backed up against was actually several clones standing on each other's shoulders. Naruto grinned and then jumped at his clones, where they all scrambled with each other, hiding the original within their ranks. Eventually, they all formed into five rows of five. Can you find the real one? 
they all chorused together, and the girls readied their arrows. I wouldn't do that. Three of us are explosive, chimed a clone from the corner, and the hunters instantly hesitated. Greek fire. Asked a hunter. The clone looked confused. I don't know what that is, but if it blows up, sure. You can call it that. He laughed, and the other clones joined him in their chuckles. The hunters were really wigged out by that. They all started walking through the lines, inspecting each clones to see if they could identify the real one. Each Naruto grinned, and another spouted off. If you guess the wrong one, we scramble again, back to square one. Unless he explodes, at which point, it's game over anyways. They all laughed, before they all stopped suddenly. But seriously, don't blow up, it might kill. The hunter's eyes narrowed, before braving on undeterred. Naruto grinned at that, and waited for them to come to a conclusion. They examined each Naruto, before walking back and frowning. And then they all started running. The clones looked confused at that, but then noticed a weird green jar on the floor. It was really pretty. It glowed faintly, and was really hot. The clones were transfixed by this, and then an arrow came through the pierce the jar. Explosion time. The clones nearest instantly puffed out of existence. The ones farther away were thrown back from the force. The hunters charged back and started picking off suspicious clones, and eventually, they stopped, with twelve clones left. They looked at each of the clones, and one of them grew angry. Oi! That could have killed someone. He was instantly shot, and he puffed into smoke, the hunters cursed, but Phoebe explained. You survived Apollo's touch when in the morning. Greek fire would have barely harmed you. One of the clones grinned, and then he undid his jacket. On the inside, were these weird tags that pulsed and flames brightly. The hunters immediately backed away, their danger senses telling them to flee. The clone grinned. Let me show you what an enemy of mine called art. He exploded in a ground shaking boom, the light waking all the campers from their bunks and lighting up the skies. When the hunters returned, they saw a massive crater and a bleeding Naruto near the outskirts. The hunters immediately rushed forward, but when they got close, Naruto rolled out of the way and tumbled down the crater side, before coming to a skidding halt and standing up with blood dripping from his face and steam sealing his cuts. The hunters were bewildered by his regeneration, and Naruto cursed mentally. What the hell was that? I wasn't even close, since when were those tags that strong? It's that fact that there isn't a chakra in this world kit, it naturally reacts much stronger than it would normally, it's a miracle I'm here, or you would have been critically injured. Naruto frowned at that, that wasn't expected. If all his seals were that much stronger, maybe that was any his summoning didn't work, he was probably summoning the whole freaking mountain with the chakra he was putting into it. That was a comforting thought, maybe he really could see them again. And they could take him home. Naruto took in a few shaky breaths before a smile came to his face. He could feel it, hope, it was here with him. He crossed his fingers and beamed at the night sky. Taiju Cage Bunshin no Jutsu, he bellowed, and the entire crater and surrounding forests were covered in smoke. The hunter's jaws dropped as the smoke cleared, revealing an army. A clone army. Thousands of Naruto clones were crammed together, looking at Naruto with hope before he muttered to them. Go. See if it's true. Don't you dare dispel until you can confirm it. Go, and please be right. They all nodded, before sprinting off at terrifying speeds. Naruto watched them go with a small smile of hope, something all the hunters missed except one. What happened? Zoe called, and Naruto grinned at her, hope. She stared at him for a moment, before charging him, the rest of the hunters coming after him. Naruto grinned at all of them, his old self burning at him. He could see them, he could hear them. Tsunade Bon, Gara, B, Kakashi Sensei, the Toads, Kono and his little crew, the Hidden Leaf Village. He could hear them. He roared at the sky and charged the hunters, who noticed his change and feel his hope, his desperate hope. They clashed. The sun rose, and the second curfew was up, the campers came running out, inspecting the field. They knew the game between Naruto and the hunters was happening, but the harpies came to eat them, and so they had to leave, but everyone was curious on what caused the big bang last night. The camp rushed forward, and was in awe and horror at what they saw. The forest, it was smaller. And a really big hole was the reason. In the center, it looked like a lake used to be there, and but now it was completely dried up, near the bottom ring, 
A weird wall was up, with a strange power coursing through it, and at the bottom was Naruto. He was out like a light, with several of the hunters surrounding him, either knocked out or sleeping peacefully. Some were beginning to wake up, and all the campers retreated in fear. They would wait till the storm was over before looking at the damage. Zoe was the first to wake up. She was sleeping fairly well, but when she felt the ground beneath her she tensed. This was Earth, not her sleeping bag. She sat up quickly, examining her surrounding and checking for weapons. She glanced at her sisters, and saw they were all sleeping on the ground, surrounding a snoring Naruto, who had a rope tied securely around his foot. She blinked as her memories came back and she smiled. They had won, though not really. They had eventually captured a clone, and tied him up. When Naruto appeared, they told him they had won as they had captured him, as the clones were technically him. He fought with them, and when they were arguing, he tripped an old trap that was there long before they arrived that night. The hunters were quick to grab him and say they won. He looked incredulous, and eventually they all laughed, which was weird, he was a male, that didn't happen. Eventually, one by one, her sisters had started to pass out. Naruto had tried to carry them, Phoebe protested vehemently, and so, they camped in the center of the crater, thought if she remembered right, Naruto was outside of it. Zoe heard a small choking sound, and she looked over to see Naruto with his eyebrows drawn together and cold sweat in his face. His right hand twitching, a blue energy appearing and disappearing in his palm, responding to his dream self calling to it. She frowned and tried to wake him, but she was soon flying backwards as a foot stretched out and planted itself on her chest with great force, grinding her skin as she slid against the inclining slope. A blue spiraling sphere in his right hand outstretched, his eyes clouded, and then the fog vanished, before dispelling his attack and rushing over to Zoe, who had blood leaking out of her mouth. Damn it. Don't do that. Naruto chastised her in anger and worry as he bit his thumb and drew a circle on her stomach with his blood, before going through some hand signs and placing his hands in a triangle shape over the circle so it was in the open space between his hands. Zoe rasped and coughed a few more times, before her breathing cleared and Naruto's blood smoked and vanished though a faded red circle was on her stomach like a scar. Zoe glared at him, before letting her head fall, which Naruto caught with a look of dismay and she muttered something out. I'm sorry, hum? I am sorry, she shouted at him, before turning her head away, I shouldn't have done that. Naruto grinned, apologized or tried to wake me up. She glared at me before coughing and flicked him the throat. Let go, before the hunters kill you for touching me. What are you doing? Naruto flinched and immediately propped Zoe up, before cowering behind her. Phoebe and a few other hunters were up, noticing the noise, and more were on the way. An accident, don't worry, I'm fine. Zoe said with placating hands, though she didn't know why the hell she was defending him. There is blood on your mouth. Naruto hastily brought a hand around with a warm white towel that he got from who knows where, and quickly dabbed her mouth clean, before shrinking back. What blood? Zoe asked innocently, and Phoebe was speechless. Zoe felt Naruto's healing hands on her back, and pushed herself onto her feet, feeling good as new. Do not delay, we have a battle with Camp Half-Blood soon, so gear up and prepare. Zoe ordered, before walking off, Naruto being left in the line of fire. He smiled nervously, before slamming both palms on the ground and the weird wall around them lost its power, and then crumbled. He was sent a few questioning looks and Naruto only grumbled. To protect you from the monsters in this forest while we slept, geez, what did you think I was doing? Keeping you prisoner. He thought angrily, before jumping high in the air and running off. I hope he isn't participating in the games, a hunter said quietly. She was answered with solemn nods. Phoebe on the other hand watched him go, before turning to them to get ready. I have my questions boy, and you will answer them. Naruto ran over the treetops, taking note of the campers in awe of the destruction he had caused, a few years ago, he would have been thrilled at the attention, but now, yikes. I'm going to have to fill that hole huh? Well, a talk to Chiron is needed, maybe I can ask him to let me fill it with water, much easier than earth. Naruto ran to the big house, before jumping down towards the earth and landing in a crouch, walking in without pause as his ears detected the desired presence. Chiron and Lord Grape Squeezer were on the patio playing another game of Pinnacle, he had been allowed to play before, but was kicked out because they ran out of stuff to give him for prizes. 
That was a funny day to see Grape sink in depression when he handed over his Diet Coke. Naruto walked in with a grin and sat down at the table, looking at Chiron with a knowing glance. How much trouble am I in? Chiron sighed. You're not a demigod of this camp, so you are outside my jurisdiction. Mr. D has full authority. Naruto turned to Mr. D, who looked like he would rather be there than anywhere else. So, can I just make it a lake? It would be a pain to fill it back up with earth, but not impossible, it's your call, it's your forest after all. Mr. D was looking everywhere but Naruto, do what you wish. It needs to be repaired by the time the capture the flag game commences. Naruto nodded with a sigh and got up, before turning to Chiron. I'll make it partially a lake, a middle ground. I know the nature spirits would enjoy a place to hide from those pervy satyrs. Chiron snorted and Mr. D flinched, remembering what landed him with his punishment in the first place. Naruto walked of, settling for a walk instead of a run as he talked with his, hum, mind mates. They were kind of like his roommates, but in his mind. Ha ha, very funny gaki. Son Goku snorted. Naruto grinned and laughed lightly. He and his biju tenants talked for a while on the best plans, before finally deciding to talk to the nature spirits for their approval before doing anything. What a lucky decision. Because when he entered the common ground for him and the spirits, he saw a satyr running around trying to catch a dryad, who was less than happy about his advances. Naruto growled and the spirit heard him, and with a look of hope she ran behind him. The satyr didn't notice in time. Poor bastard. He collided into Naruto head first like he was a tree, which was a common trick to dislodge a dryad. He looked gleefully upward, probably hoping to see the dryad fall out into his waiting arms. What he was met with was the cold, hard, deadly stare of the current lord of the wild, the champion of Pan. His furrowed brow seemed to cast a menacing shadow, his awakening silver eyes glinting like oiled steel under the moon as they held a silent, powerful promise. Pain. The satyr shrieked in terror and tried to flee, but Naruto grabbed one of his horns and harshly slammed him into the ground head first, bringing a pained bleat to his ears. Naruto lifted his prisoner into the air and glared at him. I believe I made myself clear on the proper methods of visiting, communicating, and interacting with the other nature spirits. This was definitely the top five of what I said was not to be done. At what point did you misunderstand? Perhaps I should clarify once again and I know who would be the perfect people to help get the message across. And they just so happened to be visiting today. The satyr's eyes widened in fear, and slight excitement, creepy. Naruto's glare hardened, and then turned to the spirit behind him, who was blushing up a storm. Her green cheeks a potent shade of red as she clung to his back. Did he do anything to you? Are you okay? He asked caringly, his aggressive aura gone and replaced with a soft and warm aura. The dryad buried his face into his back, shaking her head. No, I'm okay. She muttered, and then shivered when Naruto's hand came around and grabbed her shoulder, before pulling her to his side and he smiled down at her with a large smile. Oh good. I was thinking I might have had to kill him, would have been a shame. The satyrs whimpered and then got down on all fours, apologizing to the dryad profusely. She accepted it with a blush and smile, and the satyr fled at high speeds. Naruto watched him go, before looking back down at the dryad. Hey, do you mind if you gather your sisters? I'm about to repair the big crater I left in the playing fields, and I wanted to know if any of you had a preference. Her eyes widened before she nodded happily and walked into a tree, before a green pulse echoed through the forest. Naruto watched as spirits answered the call, and he walked to a nearby stream so he could meet with everyone. Can't leave out some of them can he? Naruto watched with a smile as the spirits in the forest convened around him, each with their joyful smiles and fluttering dresses, flowers in their hair or dewdrop jewelry made of water. Naruto couldn't help but smile at all of them, something they reflected back with a tad more red to their color. Hey everyone. Sorry for calling you on such short notice, but I had a few things I needed to discuss with you, sorry if you were in the middle of something, I will try to keep it brief. They all nodded while some were stuttering and telling him it was not big deal, he could call them anytime. Naruto nodded his thanks, making a naiad shrink behind her siblings with an even larger red tinge. I am responsible for the crater in the forest, I wanted to apologize to you all, I miscalculated the power of my technique, and caused much more harm than intended. Naruto stated, giving a small bow in apology. They were quick to forgive him and he smiled, thanks, anyway, I'm going to repair it, 
I wanted to know, since it's in a sense a blank canvas of land, what did you want it to be? A lake? A flat plain? A garden? Waterfall? It's your forest, Mr. D told me to do as I wish, only as Iong as I finish it before the game today. So, what will it be? Any preference? The spirits looked overjoyed by his question, and brought about some changes and in inputs, some landscaping ideas, and a few general landmarks. A few of the water spirits actually used the river surface as a template, controlling the water in such a way it was almost like an interactive 3D blueprint. Naruto grinned at the info, before nodding and thanking them all. Thanks guys. I'll be sure to do that, but I will need you guys to supervise so I don't get it wrong, don't be shy to point it out okay? This is the earth, it doesn't like to change. They nodded with smiles and then Naruto turned serious. Before I called this meeting, I stumbled upon a satyr chasing after a spirit. They gasped in shock at that, and frowned and the dryads comforted the spirit in question. Naruto sighed. I got there before there was any damage done, however this shows me that my word is being questioned, and maybe even ignored. I ask you, has this happened before? Has anyone else broken my word? He stared out over them all, and was angered as he saw several hands go up. A lot. Naruto clenched his fists in anger. Were you successful in getting away? Luckily, he got nods and smiles, and he sighed in relief. Well, that is good, but then his expression grew angered and darkened. But it appears I will need to re educate them, maybe with some help this time. He knew that it was a rare thing for a dryad to be caught, they were terribly fast on the run, and even faster when fleeing. The attempt itself was the issue. He looked at the spirits and noticed they were all watching him with lazy and embarrassed smiles, and Naruto looked confused before shaking himself. They are just happy about my stance, that's all. Naruto nodded to all of them with a smile and waved them after him. Alright, I'm going to get started, wanna watch? He was about to walk away, but a naiad stopped him, and pointed to a tree. They have been watching us this whole time, do you know who they are? Naruto immediately blurred from existence before a cry of dismay was heard in a small crash. Naruto landed back on the forest floor, his opponent landing in a heap on the grass. Can I help you, Phoebe? Naruto asked in part shock and surprise. How did we not sense her? What? We did, were you not paying attention? Don't look for chakra signatures, we've been over this. Kukua reprimanded immediately, and Naruto cringed internally at the reminder. Phoebe stood up, brushing herself off. I have questions, and you promised me answers. Naruto frowned at her, before nodding. Yes, I did, and I didn't forget if that was what you were wondering, at all. I have to fix the crater from last night, we caused quite the explosion, and I need to fix that before the game between you and the campers. So, hope you don't mind waiting a bit. Now, she said with a frown, and Naruto frowned in turn, the spirits behind him giving their own glares at Phoebe. She ignored them and focused on Naruto who looked to be thinking. If you insist, come on. Naruto started walking away, and Phoebe ran in front of him at high speeds, her bow drawn in his face. Naruto continued walking, undeterred by her arrow. It was blunted, and it couldn't break his skin. If she aimed it right, she might break his nose, but he was fast enough to catch any throat or body shots. Are your questions about me so important that I have to break my word just to hear them? Naruto asked with confusion. I gave my word, and if there is one thing about me that will always fall back on, it's that I keep my word, to death. Phoebe stared at him harshly, annoyed that he did not fear her, men should know their place. She shot her arrow at high speeds, and Naruto caught it with a blur of his hand, before looking at her in anger. Hey! What's your problem? Naruto said angrily, before tossing the arrow back to her, I'm on a deadline. I promised I would answer your questions, however I didn't say I would answer them first thing. You passed out, so you missed your spot on the queue last night. You had to wait your turn, the spirits come first now. He said with iron in his tone, before finally walking past her, his negative emotion sensing going through the roof as he did so. She is angry, but also confused. Be wary of her kit, she hasn't come up with her own answers yet. Naruto thanked Kurama and kept walking, though he activated sage mode as he moved on, the spirits immediately moving closer when he did so. He smiled at them, but he was using it to enhance his senses. If the other hunters were confused, he might need to fight for his life, or his man bits, whichever they targeted first. 
Naruto sat at the edge of the crater. He gazed at it with annoyance and a tinge of sadness. He closed his eyes and clapped his hands together, before slapping his palms on his knees and took a deep breath in. His entire body posture relaxed and his hands fell slack as his knuckles fell to the ground. He was in his own world at this point, and wasn't aware that he had an audience other than the nature spirits. The hunters of Artemis were thinking of looking for more traps, when they saw Naruto and a group of nature spirits walk into the clearing. They were shocked with what they were watching happen right now. Naruto's outline glowed green powerfully, green energy vaporizing and rising from him like a noxious cloud, but everything it touched healed. The ground in the crater started to break apart and rise, while some stayed low and even went further. The landscape tossed itself around while Naruto hummed lowly in concentration. Water started to compress itself out of thin air and filled several small pools, and a waterfall sustained itself on the tumultuous terrain. Once the ground was brought to the correct shape, grass from under Naruto and the edge of the circle began to creep in. Tree roots started to shoot out, and as they traveled underground, small saplings stood in their place when they breached the surface. A cave opening stopped some of the growth, but it was soon hidden behind a thick curtain of vines. Trees started to appear, but instead of pines and firs, willow trees grew to impressive heights, their listless branches and leaves free to flutter as they please. The entire change took about an hour, but as it happened, everyone assumed it took much less time. Being transfixed by this display of power really screwed their senses over. Naruto's aura of power faded, and the unnatural glow he gave the outside world faded. Naruto fell back, breathing heavily with sweat pouring off his brow. The power of the wild, wow, hurts like a bitch. The spirits and hunters frowned at his language. Congratulations. The hunters are victorious. For the 56th time in a row, he finished in a normal voice, obviously saddened that the outcome hadn't changed, but not surprised. Perseus Jackson. Talia roared and confronted him. Their argument was quick, and fairly hostile on Talia's side. Naruto sat on a high branch in the trees, watching the scene unfold with an unreadable expression, except for his closed fists. Zoe was being congratulated by her sisters, and Phoebe was glaring up at the blonde in the trees. Naruto watched the two of them tousle, before Percy was thrown backwards, before colliding into a tree and stopping. A sizzling was heard and smoke came from his clothing. They had a brief spat, before Naruto felt a presence approaching, he decided enough was enough. Percy and Talia launched their attacks at each other, compressed water shot versus a lightning bolt. Naruto appeared right in between the two attacks, and held his hands apart to intercept them as they collided. The elements collided with him. He winced at the lightning, nagging himself to start building a resistance, but kept it under wraps. The water hit his hand and splashed up against it like a stone wall, before spraying backwards. The lightning wrapped around his hand like a snake in its coils, before it dissipated in a small light show of badassery. Talia and Percy were speechless at his sudden arrival, and Naruto glared at the both of them, before turning and looking into the forest. Everyone turned to look where he was looking, and their faces dropped in shock and horror. The old mummy that was the oracle was walking towards them, green smoke waving around her at a forms of snakes as she moved. It stopped in front of the hunters, earning shocked looks from the campers, and opened her mummified mouth and spoke in a raspy tone. Approach speaker, and ask. Naruto was shivering as he heard the voice, it reminded him of Orochimaru, but less evil. Just the way it grated in his ears, it made him shake. Zoe swallowed hard, before stepping forward and staring at the oracle. What must I do to help my goddess? The oracle started shooting green smoke everywhere, and her disembodied voice started to carry itself all over the forest. Five shall go to the goddess in chains, accompanying the conqueror of pain. Champion of the wild shall stand at the dawn of day. But the giant of bronze will stand in his way. The bane of Olympus shall show the trail. Maidens and campers combined will prevail. The titan's curse must one withstand. But against all, the sage will lend a helping hand. The oracle snapped her jaw shut, and then turned to walk, and stood in front of the grim face of Naruto. What is, Naruto began to say, but he was cut off by the disembodied voice returning. Carrier of the Nine, death only awaits. The land of fire, saved by your fate. A single choice will be your own, to doom this world or return home. You will aid the half-blood of the eldest gods, to change this world and create a new law. 
The home of the gods will be saved, but will fall. And only you can bear the weight of all. The oracle staggered back, before sitting down on a lone rock, and returning to her hardened disposition. Chiron and Dionysus were bug eyed at the prophecy, and Naruto stood stock still, his heart starting to crack. A single choice your own, to doom this world or return home. Naruto felt his knees buckle as he fell to the earth, his hands catching him from falling face first. He gripped the earthen carpet beneath him, tears threatening to spill from his eyes. Naruto, Seiken started, but stopped, what could she say? Naruto coughed roughly, before returning to his feet and plastering on his trademark smile. All right, well, looks like I'm tagging along to return your goddess Zoe, who's coming with? She stared at him in awe of how he could just shove the pain behind him. The oracle literally just told him he was going to die. Death only awaits, what a cruel fate to hear. Naruto stared at her, noticing she wasn't going to answer. He sighed and turned around, his white sage cloak swaying behind him with his steps. All right, well, I'll come by the big house at lunch, we can decide then, Naruto said, he looked like he wanted to say something more, but held his tongue and turned, before disappearing into the trees. Nature spirits appeared around him as he walked, following him as they tried to console him, but he only smiled and told them nothing was wrong. Which was a load of BS the spirits only watched him go farther as he entered monster territory, a sadness descending over the audience of campers and hunters alike. Naruto sighed as he lay with his back to the earth, staring up at the clouds like the memory of a certain Nara he was fond of, he couldn't wrap his head around it. Hey, you remember that guy the first gave my title to for the worst luck? Yes, the smoocher in the lake. I reclaim my title, this is crap. The Biju laughed dryly at the statement, which wasn't wrong in the slightest. The nicest people really did have the worst luck huh? He was hated by his village since he could remember. He crushes on a girl who fell for his teammate. His teammate then betrays everyone, almost killing him, and the girl he loves blames him for it. He fights as hard as he could to get him back, suffering losses and tragedies along the way, after saving the whole fucking world, his friend betrays him again. After a crazy battle, which they are both left with a missing limb, he returns the hero he always wanted to be. To be loved and respected by everyone, and then he gets yanked into this world. Back to square one, with only his name, lifelong companions, and enough power to destroy everything in sight, and then told he was going to die. His only hope at returning home was to doom this world to whatever it was doomed for. Naruto snorted as he reflected on his life, he felt like hanging himself with his own cloak. Naruto, it will be fine. I can safely say that with our aid, only death itself will offer a challenge. Naruto smiled, but felt it slide slightly as he closed his eyes, yeah, to bad that is exactly what's waiting for me. The Biju frowned, Kit, this isn't anything different from our home. Naruto sighed, no, it is different, food is cheaper. Kurama snarled, don't get snippy. This is exactly like Konoha. Everyone shamed you condemned you. Nobody believed, or wanted you to survive. But you did. You lived. You're alive. Fight for it damn it. Show the people of this world that fate has nothing on you. Naruto stared vacantly at the sky above, mulling over the words Kurama had spoken. A familiar smile started to tug at his lips as he sat up. Well, I have to aid the hunters, we'll start there. Isobu sighed, progress, Naruto snorted before standing up and brushing off the non-existent grass and dirt of his pants. He started walking for the big house, wondering just how the oracle knew he carried the nine inside him. Prophecies are freaky, but then again. He was the child of prophecy. Thanks for that, grumpy old drunken toad. Naruto walked into the big house recreational room, staring at the assembled figures. All the cabin head counselors were sitting in their chairs, arguing over a pool table. Zoe stood standing with a few hunters behind her. They saw me come in, and all conversation died immediately, all eyes on me. Naruto walked in and snorted, and look at that, you're all quiet, I didn't have to tell you to stop talking. We are learning. He said with happiness, though even to him it sounded a little fake. Naruto walked to the pool table, before jumping into the center and sitting on it, staring at all the campers. Okay. This is how this is going to go. I have been chose by the oracle of whatever to accompany the hunters on their quest to save their goddess. Which means, that I am outside the five mentioned in the prophecy. Now, 
combined you will prevail, which means that at one point or another, I can't fight for you. You will have to win on your own. Knowing that, you will need to balance yourselves out. I recommended three hunters and two campers. Naruto turned to look at everyone behind him, knowing that the hunters are leading the quest, I recommend female members to increase teamwork. I won't go asking if you're a virgin or not, so don't be afraid to step up. All around the campers blushed, but the hunters only stared at Naruto, a few even held pity. Naruto sighed, because I can't fight in the battles that count, I recommend a powerhouse, someone who can fight like hell and win, even at the cost of their own life. We need someone who will not flee, and will face the battle, even if it's completely hopeless, and fight anyway, Chiron, do you have someone who matches my description? Chiron frowned, you're asking for a selfless hero, you realize that right? They may be battle hardened, but they're kids, nobody has faced something like that. Naruto snorted, oh, I guess it's just me then, he muttered, before looking at Talia, who flinched at his eyes, they were so serious. Talia, you're a child of the big three right? Zeus? She nodded. Naruto nodded, okay, that's one, who else? Grover. Percy said, he may not be a half-blood, but he is a camper, and he has several tracking spells and abilities that could prove useful should some covered Artemis's tracks. They abducted a goddess, we need a sure-fire way to locate her. Naruto nodded in agreement, and smiled, and who said you were a complete idiot? Your girlfriend must be nailing some brains in there pretty good. Annabeth and Percy turned crimson and started yelling, vehemently arguing against this claim, and Naruto only laughed. It wasn't long until they started yelling at each other. The campers and Chiron had a good laugh at their red embarrassed expressions. Even Mr. D smiled faintly at the argument. Naruto caught it and smirked knowingly, and the god only hid behind his wine magazine. Percy was glowing red, before he shook himself with a thought. Percy stood up, wait, I want to go too. Naruto turned to him, and studied him. The hunters seemed to panic at this, and Zoe announced her distress. No, I refuse, traveling with a male is out of the question. But you traveled here with me. That was under direct orders in an emergency for a short distance. We barely tolerated it as it was. But Naruto is a boy. A clone of Naruto suddenly popped into existence, appearing right in front of Percy, clad in only wispy smoke and blonde pigtails, she smirked sultrily at the son of Poseidon, who was gaping like a fish. Are you Suor? Percy's nose exploded like a geyser along with all the other males present. Chiron staggered, but held himself together. Mr. D didn't appear to notice, but if you looked closely, you could see a small river of crimson dripping under his magazine. All the girls were staring in shock at the nude seductress, before Naruto quickly grabbed a pool pole and whacked her, dispelling her and he sat back, sighing. Well, now that we have all the boys out of the way, I'd say that we are ready to depart. Naruto said calmly, while the hunters looked like they wanted to kill him. Wah well, what was that? Clarice said with shock, a small red river under her nose. Naruto looked at her with surprise, and then a smirk. That was actually my first ninja technique of my own creation. My home world was filled with perverts of all shapes and sizes. Even children were corrupted at an early age. The only reason I remained untouched was because people would rather torture me than share. I created the technique to stun and incapacitate the perverts, or used it as a distraction to make an escape. It is a tad embarrassing, but its results are all around you. He said with a wave of his hand, gesturing to the floor where all the boys lay, except the Apollo cabin leader. Noted. The girls looked appeased slightly, but were rather put off by the torture comment. Naruto looked to Zoe, well, do you have your hunters picked? She nodded, and two girls stepped forward, Phoebe and Bianca? Are you sure? She is the newest member of your crew. Zoe frowned, yes, but she is skilled, and if her godly parent is who I believe, her help will be invaluable. Naruto stared at her for a moment, and Zoe found herself unsettled by the complete lack of emotion in his eyes. He was so focused, his mind running those scenarios at high speeds, calculating if they missed anything. Naruto eventually dropped her gaze, and turned to Chiron. Then I believe we are all set. He looked to Zoe, I'm assuming you want to leave when the moon is out. Easier to track her am I right? She looked surprised, but nodded, yes, tonight we head out. After dinner, meet here for finalizing our plan. The conscious campers dispersed, 
while Chiron and Will went about waking up their sleeping campmates. Naruto followed the hunters, and after a while, they turned to him with a look of irritation. Are you following us to discuss the quest? It isn't necessary. Just do as you're told and we will be fine. Naruto snorted, while I would like to retort with some snappy comment on my combat experience, it's not why I am here. Phoebe, it's your turn. Zoe looked confused, when Phoebe stepped forward, she was about to start when Naruto stopped her with a raised hand. I will answer your questions, but I will answer you, not anyone else. The information I share, depending on what it is, will be extremely dangerous. I must ask that when I give you the information, anyone outside the hunt will never of it. You must swear to an oath of secrecy. Are we clear? Phoebe looks smug, and why should I? You will answer my questions regardless. Naruto frowned, because if you don't, I will have to kill you. The hunters immediately tensed, and closed ranks, hands on their weapons. What? Naruto grimaced, again, that all depends on the questions you ask, but if you can't keep quiet, you will have to die. I'm sorry, but it has to be that way for now. They looked at him with a mixture of anger and worry. If he wanted to kill them, he probably could. Phoebe looked at him hatefully, but nodded, very well, I swear. That isn't necessary yet. Naruto interrupted with a wince, only if the questions need it. If they don't then there is no need. Please, ask away. Phoebe looked even more angered, before taking a deep breath. Have you ever done any harm or thought of doing harm to any woman with selfish intentions in mind? Naruto looked genuinely insulted at the question. No, I have never allowed my personal wants and desires to affect myself so greatly that I would harm another. They looked at him strangely, before Phoebe gripped her fists together. Swear it. I swear. Swear it on the river sticks. Naruto looked confused, but nodded, I swear on the river sticks. Thunder rumbled in the sky and the girls watched with a confident look in their eyes, which only widened in shock as Naruto still stood there, waiting for their next question. Phoebe's eyes were the size of dinner plates as she stared at him in disbelief. Never? Naruto looked even more angered by that, yes. Last question. Phoebe looked at him in shock, I still have two. Naruto snorted, no, you have one. Speak. Phoebe glared at him, but she was the only one. The rest of the hunters were looking at him in awe and respect. No, no way. Can we count on you? Phoebe asked quietly, her voice. All the hunters stared at her in shock, but looked to Naruto, blank expressions. Naruto looked at them, and then a grin connected his cheeks, for as long as I am under contract from Artemis, I will do my absolute best to keep you healthy and safe. I will not abandon you, I will stick by, until one of you shoots me, at which point I might be farther away but I'll be close by," he said with eyes glittering with humor. The hunters looked, not happy, but relieved almost that they couldn't really count on his aid. Phoebe was staring hard into his eyes, and he sighed, before raising his hands. I swear of the river sticks. Thunder rumbled in assent, and Phoebe's shoulders slacked with relief, before eyeing him with a smirk, and a bit of humor. You know, you might not be all that bad, for a boy. Naruto rolled his eyes and walked off. Name is Naruto girl, get it right. They parted ways, but unknown to the other, all of them had a faint smile on their faces. What do you mean Phoebe isn't coming? Zoe sighed, glaring at Talia. Those boys of Hermes put centaur blood in her shirt. Her skin is healed and she is healthy thanks to Naruto, but the stress on her mind and shot immune system isn't mission ready anymore. We will have to leave without her. What? But we need five. We did but now we have four, we can't waste time to pick a new member," Zoe said with a quickly growing angered tone. Naruto sighed as he watched the two bicker, before turning to Bianca, who looked to be gripping her silvery clothes in her nerves. Hey, do you what their problem is? She shook her head, but Grover spoke up, it's complicated, it happened a while back, almost a few years now actually. Talia was thinking of joining, same as Annabeth, but something happened, I wasn't there for that, but they have been against each other ever since. Naruto sighed, before looking back at the two, his eyebrow twitching in anger. He watched them for a few minutes longer, growing increasingly annoyed. Eventually, their argument descended into baseless name calling, and he finally snapped. I can see why the Oracle asked me to go with you. If I left you alone, this mission would never succeed, he said loudly, drawing the angered female's attention. 
What did you say? Talia roared, electricity crackling though her spear. Naruto snorted. Look at you two, arguing like little sisters. Here is the bottom line. Phoebe isn't coming. We aren't going to pick another member, and we are wasting time standing here listening to you insult contest. If you're gonna continue, I'm going to knock you out and throw you in the trunk, with gags and rope. Don't test me. Naruto then turned and headed towards the van, ignoring their yells at him to stop, and got in the passenger seat. Zoe quickly got in the driver's seat, which ended up in another pointless argument, and Naruto blew up. He released some key that made everyone in the car pale and he spoke in a demonic voice that Zoe remembered, and didn't like. Drive. She complied and geared up to go, before rolling forward and picking up speed. Grover tried to make light conversation, but in the end, it settled into silence as Naruto stared out the window emptily, depressed to be outside of nature's comforting field. He really hated the city. It was disgusting seeing all these metal towers and feeling all the toxins and garbage in the air. Naruto stood in front of the National Air and Space Museum, staring at the darkened rooms and well-groomed lawns. He felt a pang of annoyance for the bushes, which were whacked and chopped into ghastly shapes of conformity. What part of that was artistic? Naruto. What are you standing there for? Come on. Grover says it's this way. Naruto looked to see Talia waving at him, and he gave a hesitant nod, before following. After they entered they started looking around, though Naruto just summoned some clones and had one go with each person. He sat at the receptionist desk, looking at all the cameras and then closed his eyes, extending his senses for energy. Monster he found out earlier had a unique energy, or aura. It was predatory, but also violent like an assassin. It was like looking for a rock buried under mud in the middle of a river, but with his nine buddies, it was easy. The building next door, there is a strong presence there, but it isn't a monster, it's colder. Stronger. Naruto nodded, before creating a clone and dispelling it, sharing his knowledge with the clones on guard duty. He then rose from the desk and walked out, before turning and heading for the building. And then he heard a loud shout. Naruto looked at the doors and saw men slam it closed, before he heard footsteps running at him. Naruto twitched, but as he was about to attack, the figure appeared. It was Percy. Naruto. Take me to the others. We got a major problem and it's coming fast. Naruto just grabbed him and then turned and threw him behind him, just in time for a large lion gleaming with a metallic luster landed in front of Naruto, and twelve skeleton warriors started to hobble towards him, part of Jackson's missing sleeve was in their hands, and some of them were smelling it. Naruto would have sighed, but he was focused on the lion in front of him. If the skeletons were tracking Percy, then he wouldn't get in the way. They were slow, and would likely avoid him if he avoided them. So he let them pass, but kept his eyes on the lion. Once the skeletons passed him, clones popped into existence, and grabbed a skeleton, before hurling them back towards the building they came from, crashing into the wall and ground, and one hit a car, which would be pricey. Naruto never took his eyes off the lion, and just when he was about to make a move, Grover shouted out. Naruto. Watch out. The lion immediately lost focus in Naruto and charged after Grover, who yelped and ran into the building. Naruto cursed and followed after him. Grover you idiot! Naruto shouted as he grabbed the lion's tail, and with a hard yank, he stopped the beast's charge. He went up to the lion and delivered an earth-shattering punch to its head, sending the creature flying backwards. What the hell do you mean, watch out? What did you think I was doing? It was standing right in front of me. How could I have missed it? He roared, before the lion roared in kind and charged him. He caught the beast's mouth and held his ground, before a clawed paw swiped at him. He jumped over the creature's head, flipping and dropping with a downwards kick. The ground cracked as the creature sank into the floor from the strike. Naruto looked at the damage for a moment, before smiling. I bet Ba Chan would be happy to see me use her move. He walked closer to the beast, who suddenly opened its eyes and lunged at him, head butting him savagely and sending him careening into a display, knocking it over on top of him. The lion started climbing, jumping from exhibit to exhibit as it chased after the hunters and Percy. Talia was running to the receptionist desk for something, and Grover was frantically playing his pipes, trying to confuse the beast. Naruto dug himself out of the rubble, rubbing his forearms. Damn, I actually felt that. Do not allow this to make a mockery of us. I refuse to accept being defeated by a mangy cat. Naruto snorted, before shooting up, 
running on top the air and then drawing level with the beast again. It swiped at him, but he caught the paw and pulled. He landed on the creature's back and it fell to the ground floor, riding and slamming into things to try and get Naruto off. Zoe. The mouth. Shoot it. Zoe and Bianca ran forwards with practiced grace, leaping from insane places to opposite vantage points, before raining down silver arrows that stabbed into the maw of the beast as it roared. The lion screamed in outrage, and then Percy appeared on the bottom floor, a food snack in his hand. He charged and threw it into the beast's throat. Naruto felt like yelling at the kid, but then the beast started to choke. It writhed and struggled, until it landed on all fours and coughed. Spitting the food out. Percy stared at it for a few seconds, before running back to cover with a lion on his heels. The hunters tried to regain its attention with arrows, but it just bounced off its skin. He roared in outrage, and then Naruto had an idea. Naruto leapt off the creature's back, before landing in front, commanding all its attention. He pulled out a small ball of what looked like paper, and then entered a grappling stance. The hunters and campers screamed at him to get out of the way, but Naruto held firm. The lion roared and tried to bite him, and Naruto let him. Naruto grimaced in pain as it bit into his flesh. His spectators screamed and Percy ran in to try and deter the creature, but Naruto smirked suddenly. The beast's eyes stared to widen as if struggled to swallow, and when it did, it let go of Naruto, smoke pouring out of its maw as it coughed. Naruto sank to the floor with a grin and a bleeding arm, and then muttered out one word. Boom. A large explosion was heard and the lion puffed out like a water balloon, blood flying out of its mouth, as fire exploded out of it, along with a lot of smoke and heat. The lion keeled over and fell, dead. Naruto smirked at the creature, before looking at his arm. He tried to move his fingers, and when they didn't move, he glared in annoyance. Severed the tendons, bastard, those are some seriously sharp teeth. Percy and the other ran to him, ignoring the smoking corpse that was in the middle of the room, and addressed his wound. Naruto smiled at them, ignoring the growing pool on the floor. Don't worry, I'm fine, I survived a lot worse than this. If anything, it's another cool story. Think that maybe the scars will pass of as a shark bite. Now that could be cool. Zoe looked at him like was an idiot, and Bianca was trying to get his wound to close with some bandages. Percy was struggling to open his canteen of water and Grover was looking worried from a distance, but he was busy charming the guards, so he could come over. Percy eventually gave up on the canteen and stretched his hand to a water fountain, before water bust out of it and flooded towards Naruto, snaking over his skin gently and healing his abrasions. Naruto watched the process with fascination, it was truly an interesting process. When Percy got to the major wound on his arm, Naruto stopped him. Don't worry about that one, it's already healing, save your strength. The group looked confused, before a strange red energy started hissing on his skin. It bubbled like acid as it covered the room, and then the smell of burning flesh hit the air as Naruto grit his teeth slightly as the wound regrew tissue, healed the bone, replaced the blood, and regrew skin in a matter of seconds. Naruto stretched his arm, and was a little saddened. Darn, I was hoping for scars, oh well, can't always win. What was that? Percy asked in shock. He had never seen any healing regeneration spell faster than his own, or Apollo's healing techniques. Naruto smiled at him, there are a few benefits to being raised in hell. Naruto stood up a bit shakily, but stretched and smiled, before realizing his sleeve was completely torn off and stained red. Damn it, I like this shirt. He turned to the store, ignoring the looks he was getting from his companions, and yanked off a dark blue shirt. He looked at the corpse and frowned, is it supposed to do that? The group looked to see where he was pointing, and realized that the body wasn't exploding, but rather shrinking down. It became two items, a long overcoat, and a dagger? Naruto walked forward and lifted up the items, before tossing the cloak over, and looking at the dagger. A new kanai, he said with a smile, before it poofed out of existence in his hand. Naruto smiled at getting a kanai, he was unarmed when he came into this world. Getting a weapon he knew how to use was a blessing. Naruto looked to the group, who were still staring at him, frowned. What? Is the cloak not your style? W well this gg great. Talia said in the middle of her shivers. Percy is chattering next to her, but he was definitely in better shape than her with the lion's coat. Grover looked like he was ready to jump in the fire to get warmer, 
and Zoe and Bianca were shaking, but much more controlled about it. Naruto was completely fine. Isobu survived at the bottom of the lake for several years in the middle of winter. His cold resistance was off the charts. Not to mention Matabi's hellfire was keeping him nice and toasty. Naruto stared at the homeless guy that offered them a space by his fire. That guy was old and grubby, but his face was familiar. He glanced at the railroad tracks, wondering if this line was even used anymore. He was thinking that maybe, wait. Naruto turned and walked away from the fire, before grabbing another empty trash barrel and breaking it, flattening it out like a sled. He ignored the questions coming at him from his group and walked to the train lines. I threw the can on top of the metal and spoke to Shukaku. Hey Shukaku? Your magnet release, can it propel objects though magnetism? Duh. Then allow me to test that. Naruto got on the metal and sat down, before entering a meditative position and closing his eyes. He channeled Shukaku's chakra and electricity sparked on the outside of his little, car. Naruto actually levitated off the railing for a few seconds, before moving forward slowly, and picking up speed. Eventually, he was zipping down the line at high speeds, traveling fairly fast, but it was tiring him quickly. It required a lot of energy to channel it though him, especially since he hadn't practiced it, or even used it before. He sighed in dejection, before slowing and gliding in reverse back to the group, who were now at the edge of the platform watching him come in at high speeds. Naruto thought he could be cool and stop suddenly, and maybe dismount stylishly. Yeah. No Naruto pulled to an abrupt stop in front of them, and was sent skidding off his little sled, he went careening down the railing, plowing through some snow and stopping ahead like roadkill. Grover and Percy shouted if he was okay, and Naruto lifted up a thumb to show he was alright. Zoe just shook her head and muttered something about an idiot, while Bianca looked concerned. Talia on the other hand was staring at the sled in wonder. She lawed the electricity, so maybe she could do it too? Question for later. Before any of them could go to help the staggering sage up, the homeless guy pointed at the bay, he better hurry, train is coming in soon. Naruto heard that, and then looked down the line to see a rapidly approaching light. Gulp. Naruto immediately got to his feet and sprang forward, leaping an impressive distance as he cleared both tracks, and near 30 feet of actual distance, reaching out for Talia. She grabbed his hands, and with a heave, swung him out of the way just as the train came to a stop right in front of them. Naruto landed in a heap as Talia fell on top of him in a mini dog pile. She was embarrassed at first, but then she noticed something. He was warm, really warm. She stayed there, lying on top of his back with her hands on his neck, her body absorbing his heat. Naruto was trying to resist as her hands were cold, but Talia managed to keep him from breaking away. Their audience just stared at them, before looking at the homeless man who had vanished, and even taken his fire with him. Jerk. Grover muttered before checking for a conductor and hoping on, the rest following him. Eventually, Naruto just picked up Talia in a piggyback ride and carried her into the car, her hands and body never separating from him. Once they got into the car, the door closed behind them, Naruto tried to let Talia down, but she held on to him. Talia, it's warm in here, you can let go. No, you're warm. So is the train. You're warmer. I bet the seats are warmer. She said nothing as she showed no intention of letting go, and Naruto sighed, before an evil grin split his face. Hey Talia? Her eyes opened, yeah? Do you like being upside down? She frowned, well, that depends. She shouted suddenly, as Naruto jumped straight up, before his feet hit the ceiling like he just jumped to the floor. Ah, uh, ah? Uh? Talia said in confusion, before looking around and noticing the whole world was completely upside down. She probably missed it since she was driving. Grover said with a shiver at the memory. You call that driving? Percy muttered. The group snickered, but a spark and a cry of dismay from Naruto shut them up. Naruto shrugging off the small shock, looked at her with a grin on his face. Wanna stand? She looked at him skeptically, but then decided to trust him. He crouched down and let her feet touch the floor. Talia looked confused on why her feet weren't sticking before a feeling of warmth and ecstasy shot through her system, her feet landing on the floor like they were meant to be there. Naruto stood up, not noticing her blush, and held her hand, walking her around. Her eyes were foggy from the feeling, but she was happy that she was walking around, on the ceiling. It was cool. Naruto grinned at her, and she turned and asked with a blush, 
why do I feel? Naruto smiled kindly, I'm channeling my life force through your body to allow you to walk around with me. That's why I'm holding your hand. I need to be able to channel it into you. It feels weird huh? Talia blushed heavily and turned around, yeah, sure. Naruto walked with her for a bit, before she started jumping and she was shocked to see she fell back to the floor. She laughed like a child as she jumped higher, and that's kinda where it went wrong. She jumped too high, and the normal pull of gravity resumed, she let out a small shout and Naruto laughed. He was still holding her hand, so he simply let her dangle in outrage. Naruto just laughed as she tried to smack him, but she couldn't reach. He just kept laughing until he walked to a wall, and walked down it to let her down. She glared at him lightly, but the blush was still on her face. Naruto grinned and let go of her hand as he turned to go see the others. Talia felt the warmth and pleasure she was feeling leave her system, and she frowned in sadness, before grinning at the memory. I got to do that again. Naruto walked back to the others, and took Grover for a walk too. He didn't think he could, which was funny at first, but he had to stop as he was actually leaving dents in the roof, and that wasn't a good thing. He offered for Percy, but the kid was too tired, and walked off towards the luxury cars to nap. Bianca walked on the walls, but she didn't for very long and didn't want to walk on the ceiling. She didn't want to break anything apparently, but she left with a ginormous blush and made Naruto look at her in confusion while she disappeared for the upper deck. Naruto asked Zoe as well, and while she was curious, she didn't feel the need. Naruto only smiled and nodded, before he jumped up and then lay on his back, staring down at the floor and relaxing. Zoe stared at him for a moment, and Naruto grinned at her. She changed her mind after that. She wouldn't hold his hand, so he had to keep a hand on her shoulder and a clone walking below in case he lost his grasp. She was up for the longest, truly transfixed by walking the world like it was upside down. Then Naruto got an idea. He made a two more clones and had them transform into two ankle bracelets. After she put them on, Naruto let go. At first she screamed at him and tried to right herself, but realized she was still connected to the floor. Naruto grinned at her told her the clones were doing it. It was the first time he saw her smile brightly. She started walking on the ceiling, the walls, up and down the poles. She even giggled when she jumped from the floor and the ceiling and back repeatedly, like a stalling back flip. Naruto couldn't help but laugh as she explored walking on every surface. And then she got an idea. Talia and Percy were in the same black Mercedes SLK, and were talking in tones, though Talia's was more angered than neutral. Two figures walked towards them covered in shadow, stalking along the ceiling as they talked. Both of them were about to jump down, when Naruto pointed his finger at Percy and a trail of water appearing from seemingly nowhere dripped down, splashing on his head. Percy froze, before he reached in his pocket. Talia seemed to notice this, and grabbed her bracelet over her arms. Zoe was smirking in amusement and Naruto just reached his hand over, and dropped another drop. Right down the back of Talia's shirt. Immediately, she slammed into the back of her seat, rubbing against it like a cat. Cold, 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 cold. And then she looked up. She saw Naruto and Zoe standing there. Naruto was fully laughing while Zoe had a victorious smirk. Talia growled while Percy started shaking with restrained laughter. And then she looked up in shock. Hey, you're standing by yourself. How? Zoe bent over and pointed at her ankle bracelets. An idea. Naruto laughed and nodded, they're my clones, I had the idea when everybody left. She didn't want to hold my hand, so after having a clones follow us around so he could catch her if I lost my grip, I had the idea of using clones. Talia forgot her anger and jumped at Naruto with surprising height, grabbing him by the ear. Gimme some. She fell back down, still holding Naruto's ear. Naruto lost his connection with the ceiling, and landed on top of her in a heap. Naruto let out a laugh as Talia ended up cushioning him, and she didn't offer a complaint as his warmth was once again seeping into her. Naruto got up, and she latched onto him again. Come on. Please. Naruto laughed, wow, she said please. She glared but didn't argue, and Naruto was even more impressed. Well, they are temporary, so I'm not sure how long they will last. They have lasted me some t-i-i-i-i-m-m-m-e-e. Zoe suddenly shouted in shock as the clones dispelled, and she fell for the floor head first. Naruto immediately sat up, catching the hunter and pulling her up to eye level. Hey. You okay? Sorry. 
I didn't think they would wear out that fast. You don't have a chakra network so that might be why but oomph. He. Zoe suddenly shouted, kicking her way out of his arms and nailing him in the balls. He crumpled to the floor and sat there for a moment, groaning and shuddering in pain. Percy was out of the and by his side, patting his back sympathetically. Give it a second man, it'll pass, hold on. Naruto groaned incoherently and some of his clones throughout the train fell over with him, clutching their crotches in pain. Zoe looked surprised at this. They feel your pain? Percy glared at her, are you serious? I feel his pain. That was a whopper of a kick you know. He caught you. Why'd you have to slam him in the balls? Percy said, exasperation clear, though his face had slightly paled as he watched what happened. Any man would have felt that if they saw it, it was full connection strong enough to lift him off the floor. Percy twitched as he relived it in his mind's eye, and then turned his eyes back to Naruto, who rolled to his side and groaned. W well, if any man G grabs me from behind, I T trust you to make as sure he doesn't stand up egg gain. Naruto said shakily, before two clones came over, having picked themselves off the floor, and carried him to the back seat of a Lamborghini. Grover was sitting in the front with horrified eyes slumped against the wheel with his hands by his crotch, praying that he remembered this forever whenever another hunter rolled around. That looked fucking terrifying. Naruto groaned as he lay in the back, his head resting on the cushions. Zoe wasn't sure if she should feel guilty or not, but decided that he would recover, and she would apologize, maybe. She grunted and left, while Naruto watched her go he muttered out. S sorry, I'll see you tomorrow. She nodded to him, before walking off. Talia got in the Lambo on the other side, and put his head on her lap. She may have seemed caring, but his natural heat was what she was after, and so she had no regrets. Nice rat. Percy snorted at the comment, Talia saying it just to break the ice it seemed. They were stood under the awning of a small shop, the street barren of life as not a single vehicle was parked aside it. Snow glided on still air slowly sinking simply onto the million snowflake mattress that padded near all sound. Talia and Percy found the scene hardly helpful, Percy himself was about ready to continue heading whatever direction they actually needed. Naruto stared at the town, it seemed so empty, there had to be something here. There was a cashier, there had to be something. Naruto scanned the town with much greater focus, looking for any signs of life, it couldn't be just him right? The lonely guy at the cashier couldn't be the only one. I'm going to ask around for some other suggestions, Talia said, before walking with Naruto into town. But the guy said, Percy started. Just checking. Talia said a bit forcefully. Percy just sighed and nodded, before leaning back against the wall with Bianca, making small talk. Grover went with Zoe to the cafe for some pastries and caffeine, and wax paper. Huh, weird. Naruto walked off, Talia at his side. They walked through Cloudcroft looking for anyone, and they didn't find a single other soul there. It was destitute of life, commercial and residential. Though being not alive was an undead skeleton specialty. Naruto had to pull Talia by her hood to dodge the incoming spear from them, and then had to shove her to the side into the snow as two other skeletons pulled out their pistol weapons and started shooting at them wildly. Naruto moved like fluid as he dodged the speeding bullets. They were a little bit slower than Sasuke's Raiden enhanced shuriken which was pretty fucking fast when he threw them for real. Naruto eventually charged them, extending his hand outwards with a snap, sending a burst of air outwards to make them stumble. He then turned and grabbed the still-shocked Talia, and leapt into the air despite her protests. He slung her up into a princess-style carry and her complaints cease. A miracle. The skeletons continued to shoot at them, but their aim was terrible at a distance, and so it didn't require much effort to dodge. Naruto cannonballed out of the sky, landing with a boom on the earth in front of the rest of his companions, cracking the earth slightly to gain their attention. Problem. Undead skeleton warriors on their way, we need to move. Naruto said, he was about to grab Percy when a pulse of energy pushed into his mind. Grover immediately collapsed next to his spilled coffee. The little birds on his cup coming to like, and the rat Percy bought twitched and squeaked, before scampering off. There was a dull moan from the forest like the creaking of wood, and Naruto fought to stay conscious. It was so comforting, it was like falling on your bed after three all-nighters and a long day of D-ranks and training. Naruto staggered, before Percy ended up catching him. Hey! What's going on? 
Naruto breathed heavily, before pulling himself up and looking at Talia, shock me. Wah, shock me. Zap Naruto immediately went rigid as electricity stimulated his succumbing senses. He breathed deeply before continuing, thanks, now, we need to get Grover and go, enemies inbound. The others responded, Bianca and Percy grabbed Grover and started hauling him off. He bleated occasionally and moaned with the forest. Naruto staggered occasionally as he ran, and Talia was always sure to hit him with a baby bolt to get him back. Percy was looking at Naruto like he was insane, but held his tongue as he didn't want to lose the guy now. They needed to focus to live. They made it to the edge of town, but ran into two skeleton warriors in blue police uniforms. They drew their handguns and watched us impassively. Talia jumped forward and her shield to sprung to life. Back up, slow, she said to the rest of them, and they complied. Just as they were about to turn and run, a rustling appeared behind them, and two more warriors popped out, pistols aimed at us. Both sides. Naruto muttered, and the hunters nodded, before facing both directions back to back. Naruto covered Bianca while Talia stood in front of Zoe. Grover was in Percy's arms as he melted snow and tried to heal Grover from it, before another pulse of energy rocked through the pair and Naruto staggered, dropping to a knee with labored breath. It's near. Grover moaned. It's here. Percy said in response, and Grover only shook his head in delirium. No, the gift, the gift from the wild. One on one, Percy, take the two over there, Bianca will cover. Talia, charge forward while I support. Naruto. Naruto was gone. Naruto. Zoe shouted, concerned, and then she felt another pulse, and Grover bleated again. The wild. No time, go. Percy charged forward, deflecting bullets from his blade while Talia blocked them with her shield. Zoe and Bianca fired shots from behind to slow them down. The plan was going well, until Percy was shot in the back. Percy. Talia shouted in panic, before Percy got to his feet shakily. Talia turned back to her opponents, and was not prepared for their proximity. He had the pistol in her face before she could react, and just as he was about to pull the trigger, a blur of gold smashed down, slamming the skeleton into pieces on the floor. Talia looked around her shield in surprise and gratitude as she saw the blonde mop of Naruto's hair. He stood up shakily, and almost got shot in the chest as Talia sped in front of him and blocked the shots. Naruto staggered and fell on his ass, scrambling to regain his feet, but not. His vision was swimming and the ground was warping like rippling water. Talia shielded him, but was also in a state of concern and worry as Naruto was completely lost. She dragged him up and shoved him into Percy, who caught him and noticed Naruto was fighting to stay in the realm of the living. What's hitting you? Naruto gasped and frowned as he forced himself to remain awake, nature energy, a lot of it, forcing minds, to will. Percy panicked at that, they were trying to take the most powerful player out of the game, not good. Zoe and Bianca were rapid firing at skeletons 3 and 4, trying to take them out and skew their aim so they wouldn't hit anyone. The plan was going well, till Grover sat up like he had been possessed, and reached out for the trees, as if it was coming running up to hug him. And then a large crash, like trees breaking and falling to make way for something. The skeletons stared upping the ante, charging them, slowly, whilst firing and bringing out the batons. Naruto, even in his impeded state, managed to defend and kick away a skeleton, but the fourth got around him and whacked him solidly in the back of the neck, making Naruto's eyes flicker, before dropping to the ground, body twitching as he fought to get up. Naruto. Talia screamed, jumping in the way and slapping the skeleton with her spear like a baseball bat, sending backwards towards the trees. The one she had been fighting redrew its pistol and fired again, to which she whirled around and blocked the shots, slapping Naruto across the face with her other hand to try and bring him back. Even her shocks weren't cutting it anymore, and so she settled for grabbing his shirt and dragging him across the ground. She winced as it tore up his shirt and pants but she decided his life was more important. She dragged him over, just as Bianca stepped in and stabbed a skeleton square in its chest. Percy charged to aid her, but was shocked when the skeleton burst into flames and disintegrated into ash. What did you do? Zoe inquired quickly, rapidly running out of arrows. Lucky stab? Do it more. They were being pushed back, with their strongest fighter and tracker incapacitated, they didn't really have a choice. Until the trees behind the skeletons exploded, Reet. 
A massive pig burst onto the road and rammed into the skeletons, colliding with such force that it sent them flying over the trees and slamming into a mountainside. And then it turned on them. A wild boar, thirty feet high with canoe-sized tusks and a snotty pink nose. It had brown bristles covering its entire body, and its eyes were wild and angry. At them. Talia raised her spear in defense, but Grover snapped to his senses, standing up and standing in the way. Don't kill it. That's the Aramanthian boar. I don't think we can kill it. Zoe said in annoyance. They stared at the boar, wary as its rage was palpable. It glared at everything, and then made eye contact with Talia's shield. It let out a squeal, and charged. Talia tried to dive, but it was far more nimble than anticipated. It managed to pivot, and dart straight at Talia's frame. Her shield was hardly in an idea position, and her side was exposed to be punctured. Time slowed, and her eyes slowly closed to brace for impact, but something caught her eye. A small, tri-pronged canai. A powerful slicing sound was heard, and a familiar cloak came in between her and the board. Naruto, from no here, caught the boar's incoming tusk, and reached behind him to grab Talia close. He braced himself against the floor, and slid against the ground as his feet tore trenches in the asphalt. She was in full adrenaline mode, and only had one thought. The building behind them. She raised her shield, and curled in a ball behind it, using her own body as a shock absorbed for Naruto's back as the boar pushed them headlong through a small shop. Talia. What the hell did you do? Naruto screamed as he ran, Talia hot on his heels as they weaved in and out of trees uphill. The boar was right behind them, plowing through trees and bellowing after them with a vengeance. You tell me. Maybe he likes pretty girls, he would have followed the hunters. Hey. Talia yelled in feminine fury and picked up her pace. Naruto laughed aloud and kicked it into high gear, using his unwillingness to be beaten by an enraged female to drive him forward as a rage-fueled daughter of Zeus forgot all about the boar and chased after him. They reached the top, and then ran down the slippery side, heading for the train tracks and the tunnel. Talia was right behind Naruto as they ran, intent on catching him and beating him around as the boar charged after them, slipping and sliding on the tracks. Naruto was thanking Kami for that fact and pulled ahead. As they reached the end, he saw a rickety old bridge and nearly jumped for joy, but then Talia started slowing down, her breaths falling back as Naruto kept running. He reached behind him and grabbed her, before slinging her over his shoulder like a sack and running forward. Talia kicked at him to let her go, but he didn't, he kept running ahead, until Talia's scream of fear caught him and he stopped. Talia was thrashing in his grasp, and so he set her down quickly and gently. What? We got a giant pig after your ass and you want to take a break? He goaded, but when he saw her face a pale ice white as she stared at the cliffside that descended nearly 80 meters, her knees gave out soon after, and she tried crawling back to the safety of the tunnel wall. Naruto saw the massive boar approaching, and made a split second decision. He hauled Talia back up, moving faster than she could really fight back. Come on, Talia Grace. Keep it T-O-G-T-H-E-R, he roared, before rearing his head back and head butting her sharply on her forehead. She rocked back in pain and clutched her forehead, her eyes closed in shock. Naruto took that moment, to grab her and run across the bridge. She opened her eyes to see his determined face running across the bridge, and stopped struggling, allowing herself to be carried as she thought of ways to apologize, before there was a loud rumble and a terrifying crack. The boar had made it to the bridge and broke it. Naruto fell from the middle of the bridge with a screaming daughter of Zeus, before Naruto let out a whoop for a battle cry and fell through the air after the boar. Talia was screaming the whole way, falling in terror as she clutched Naruto for dear life. Naruto laughed to try and ease her fear, but that didn't help as it sounded a little crazy. She looked at him with wide eyes and he smiled kindly. It's totally fine, I can run on air remember? Blink. Naruto stopped his freefall and started running straight down, picking up speed insanely fast. Talia screamed louder, before Naruto pulled up in a sharp U shape, and they soared into the sky, spiraling as they broke the low fog layer. Naruto smiled as he stared out at the sky, it was really clear up here, he liked it. Talia had temporarily forgotten her fear and stared in wonder at the night sky from so high. Naruto radiating his comforting warmth like a home furnace. Naruto took a deep breath, before looking at her with an apology. We are going down now, 
It wasn't a question, they dropped like a stone. They fell in free fall. Talia back to screaming in terror as they saw what was left of the bridge from overweight, and Naruto started slowing their descent. It hurt, but not as bad as the sun, that was heavy. Naruto skidded to a stop on the other side of the canyon, landing on the earth with a loud crash and stopping abruptly, using a tree as a stopper as he almost fell downhill. He looked at Talia, who was still petrified, and Naruto laughed tiredly, before sinking to his knees and leaning against the tree. Well, that was fun. How about you? I guess we learned that boars like pretty girls huh? He said with a nervous laugh, hoping to appease her soon to be rising temper. Talia just stared at him as she processed all that happened, and Naruto just held her as he leaned his head back against the tree, breathing hard. Kit, you back? Naruto frowned mentally. Yeah, the heck was that? It was like a Yamanaka jutsu, but fuzzier. Karama frowned. Yes. It hijacked your body and slowed your reflexes and senses to a crawl. I'm amazed you could even stand after that. Naruto grinned. Take more than that to keep me down. Don't we know it? Kakuo said with a grin. Naruto returned to the world as he saw Grover and Percy coming through the woods, the boar behind them transfixed on a floating apple in front of it. The hunters we on top of the creature already. So, pig cowboys. Grover nodded, before looking at Naruto. You know what that means right? Naruto nodded and grinned. It means that he isn't gone yet, perfect. Who? Pessy asked, and Zoe looked at him like he was an idiot. Pan. The god of the wild. Trash, everywhere, in huge, mountainous piles. Of trash. Naruto stared agape at the massive piles of trash that created its own horizon. Hephaestus's trash dump. Zoe said with a small amount of irritation. But Naruto was horrified. He stared out over the mountain range of trash with his emotions running rampant. What the hell is this? Naruto whispered with his eyes wider than drachmas. Zoe looked at him in partial pride and sadness. He was a sage after all, seeing this must be like being stabbed in the back by a mentor. It was good to see the one who inherited Pan's domains actually affected by such a thing. It's where all the failures are waste from Hephaestus's forge goes. Zoe said neutrally, and Naruto grit his teeth, his hands clenched so tightly his knuckles turned snow white. Change of plan, Naruto said, we are camping here, we can brave that, thing, in the morning. Zoe looked at him questionably, but sighed and agreed. The campers went about making a mini house, with Percy and Talia working on the roof and campfire. Naruto just reached down and took of his shoes, before pressing his soles onto the earth. He looked like he wanted to recoil, but couldn't jump high enough, which was saying something for a guy who could run on air. Naruto grimaced, before turning to the campers and making a silent vow. When they all go to sleep, I'm quarantining this shit. I won't let this spread. Zoe, is it okay for me to, maybe, destroy the pile? She looked at him curiously, well, you're mortal, so I doubt it. Naruto shook his head, no, like, will Hephaestus be mad? Zoe frowned, well, I don't think he will be happy about it, and since you're mortal he might take offense, but I don't really now, I have never met the god of the forges. Naruto sighed, but decided that his plan would remain unchanged. He would fix this tonight. Wait until his shift in the morning, and while he left a few clones for defense, he would start his plan. It would make it safer to navigate anyway. Naruto smiled minutely in excitement, he actually knew what he was supposed to do in this situation, and it was almost liberating having no choice but to do something he wanted to do. Naruto joined the rest at the camp and he reserved the early morning spot. Zoe seemed suspicious, but Naruto ignored her look. She wasn't needed for this, he would be done by the time the sun rose. As the group prepared for camp, a solid black limousine drove over to them, and pulled to a stop a few yards away. The group's expressions were less than blank. Everyone was flabbergasted that such a pricey car would even attempt to brave this area, and yet it was there. The driver door opened, and from the inside a burly man with scars on his face stepped out. He had a crew cut and wore black biker clothes with a tight white t-shirt and combat boots. The second he was out of the door, he glared maliciously at Percy, before turning to Naruto, his lips curling into a sneer. He turned back to Percy, who was subconsciously drawing his weapon. Calm down, this is a peaceful meeting. The man said, before snapping his fingers and everyone's weapons fell to the ground out of their hands. 
He took off in a burst of speed for Percy, but Naruto appeared in his way, halting his advance. The man seemed surprised by Naruto, and laughed. You've got guts squirt. What's your name? Who is your parent? Naruto grimaced, my name is Naruto, and I am an orphan. The man didn't seem pleased with his answer. Don't give me shit, who are they? Naruto seethed, he was feeling his anger quickly grow, and realized it was on purpose. He was increasing his aggression, needed to calm down. Naruto calmed himself, before speaking calmly, my parents are mortal, I have no godly parent. The god looked like he was just told blue whales were really red, what did I say about giving me shit? He said, before charging and stabbing his knife into Naruto's shoulder. Only to watch as the blade passed right through him, Naruto's face twisting into one of annoyance. Geez, what's your problem? You have a habit of stabbing people. The man stared at him in shock, before he growled at the insult and prepared to hit him, but a melodic giggle emanated from the limousine, and the man relented. Watch yourself Naruto. Naruto's eyes bled crimson as his demonic pupils returned, and he let loose a little killing intent. I think I'll be fine thanks. The man stared at him for a moment, before pulling down his glasses, which were like mini molten suns. Careful little man. Do you know who I am? Naruto scoffed and walked off, don't care, you wanted Percy right, speak your piece and leave. The man seethed at being dismissed, and released some power, power that Naruto recognized. Boy, you will address me with respect. Naruto turned, his eyes staring unflinching, why should I? The man snarled, I am Ares, god of war. Naruto snorted, yeah, good for you. And then he turned and continued to walk away. Ares roared in anger and charged Naruto, but before he could make contact, his target suddenly vanished, and an explosion of pain tore apart his shoulder. Ares bellowed in anger and pain and fell to the floor as a weight pushed him to the ground. He looked over and saw Naruto crouching on his back, with his arm being held snuggly behind his shoulder blades. Naruto stared at the god for a moment, before reaching forward and flicking his forehead. Sorry, Mosquito, didn't think you wanted a bug bite. The god seethed at being mocked, and in a show of strength, he pushed off the ground and threw Naruto off. He charged again, he pulled out an iron pocket knife and tried to attack him, but when he got in range, sand exploded from around them. The knife stabbed into a sand shield, before it pulled the god in and crushed the offending arm, and pulverized the knife. Ares staggered back, clutching his crushed arm and leaking ichor, the blood of the gods. Naruto observed the gold liquid curiously, before taking a nearby stick and stabbing it in, before holding it up to his eyes. Wow, to think divine blood was so ostentatious, he said simply, before dropping the stick and looking over to the surprised Jackson. Squirt, you gonna go or do I gotta punt you? Naruto said with a mock version of Ares's voice. Percy snorted at the imitation, and walked to the limousine. Ares tried to open the door for him, but Sand rose up and gently opened the door for Percy to enter, and closed it behind him. Naruto stood there, deciding that he would wait there for Percy's safety. He turned back to his group, who were shocked at his ability, they had never seen it before. All right brats, show's over you little snobs, get back to work, he said, a near-perfect imitation of Ares, sneer and all. The group just looked at him like he was crazy, but complied and got back to it. Naruto turned back and saw Ares standing up, his arm already close to being fully healed. Hey guys, is my healing that godly or what? The Biju snorted at his pun, and didn't bother to respond, though Kurama looked pleased at spilling some ichor, it was a goal of his after all. God of War huh, as if he knew what kind of horrors could be born. His studies into this world's history had given a large amount of information into this world's more bloody history. It was true that their wars were large, but in his eyes, the death toll simply wasn't an object. Sure, to him, 70 million was a massive number, but to these people, it wasn't even a tenth of the world's population. Many lives were lost, but they practically shrugged it off. A decade later, and the world was already healing. Countries had made a bitter peace, and while grudges and hatred remained, there was a ceasefire. Nobody attacked, nobody instigated, the world just moved on. He couldn't call that war. There had to be another term. He wouldn't call it a battle, or a struggle, but it wasn't war, not like the one he fought in. It simply didn't carry the same gravity as his adversaries did. This world just threw numbers at each other, 
but his adversaries? They played with life and death, they were stronger than the gods of this world. Their entire world allied themselves. They rose up, and almost lost, that kind of struggle is beyond this so-called, World War II. Two continents weren't even involved for Kami's sake. Ares. Naruto said, garnering the god's attention, do you, like war? He looked at him like he was an idiot, do I like it? Ha! Huh. He practically belted with a laugh, war isn't something that you, like, it's something you live for. He rolled his shoulders, tracing his right thumb from his left shoulder to his right hip in a long diagonal line. It's bittersweet release. It's the kind of rage that can only be given power when your limits no longer have meaning. It's selfish, it's powerful, and it's mindless. It's a monster in its own right, propelling countries years forward in both progress and wealth. It's like clearing an old forest with a burning blaze, it's so beautiful, raging on with absolute destruction, but it's warm. He turned to face Naruto, a less than sane grin on his face, it's the heart of humanity. To fight, to strive, and to die for what you believe in, have you seen it? The utter freedom that mortals have on the battlefield? They are beyond restraint, stronger than reason, and without fear, I thirst for every moment of it. Naruto frowned, but said nothing, maybe that was war, but what of his struggle? If that wasn't war, what was worse than that? What could label such a dark time other than war? Something that almost brought an end to everything. Maybe that was it. It was just an Armageddon. Maybe I had the wrong idea of what war was. Naruto said to himself, and Ares caught it, what the hell could you confuse such a powerful thing with? If anything, he looked affronted. An Armageddon. Naruto said, trying out his new name, and gave its definition. Naruto just looked up at the stars, enemies becoming allies, an entire world, every able-bodied fighter joined together to do battle. Dot and almost loosing. Using their lives like disposable weapons as they fought to the death, racing their enemy on who could kill more before they died. It wasn't progress, it was just suicidal survival, a desperate hope to take more than one with you, dying in desperate plea to give your remaining allies a fractionally better chance. Naruto's voice faded into a hoarse whisper, images of friends, family, bonds, broken and shattered by mortal injuries and the injustice of just one man. Ares looked surprised at that, seeing the obvious trauma that haunted the blonde's shoulders. Brat. Dot how many? Naruto looked away, too many, or maybe just not enough. An Armageddon. Ares tried the term himself, taking the new meaning of the word with a nod of his head, must have been gorgeous. Naruto balled his fists, but remained in his place. His silence was all he could manage, words unable to convey just how wrong this god really was. A few minutes passed, before Percy stepped out of the limousine. Naruto snapped to attention watching Percy move past him with a mask concealing his emotions. Naruto seemed puzzled by this, but let it slide and as he walked by, he turned to walk with him, only for a soft and luscious voice to call his name. Naruto, come speak with me. The voice said from inside the limo. Naruto looked curious, and as he complied, he sent his pals a message. Guys, I don't know who this girl is, but she has got some major skills in genjutsu. Seal yourselves from my hearing and monitor my chakra, we can't take any chances. Naruto, don't worry about us, while visual genjutsu will work, audible will not. Same for you now actually, consider it a gift for being such a good warden. Matabi said playfully, and Naruto grinned at her. Naruto stepped into the limo, and felt his breath strain as he beheld the beauty in the car in front of him. Yeah, about not being immune to visual. Well, you're lucky some of us are female. Seiken said with a cheeky grin. Naruto sighed in relief, before settling in his seat and staring at the goddess. Considering that punk out there was Ares, I assume you're Aphrodite? The woman glowed at being recognized and smiled at him, yes, I am Aphrodite, goddess of love, lust, and beauty. Naruto sighed, the Olympians really like to toot their own horns, so, what did you want to speak about? The goddess purred and reached out, her fingers primed to stroke his cheek, but a small wall of sand materialized from the still open door and blocked her. She seemed to be annoyed by this, but soon a spark of amusement entered her eyes and she giggled. Playing hard to get. How childish, but it's cute, she said seductively, and Naruto turned so he wasn't looking at her. The night is coming, I need to help me friends with the camp, what did you want to talk to me about? Naruto said more firmly, 
hoping to get the goddess to get serious. Aphrodite poked her finger into her lip cutely and hummed, Ooh, so serious. Why don't you just relax, she said, her voice drawing closer as she invaded his personal space. His instincts were telling him to run, while another part of him wanted to retract the sand armor on his check to give her better access. Naruto shook his mental self and rebuilt his fortitude. He turned his eyes to the goddess. Which was a massive mistake. She was on her hands and knees, staring at him lustfully as her sizable cleavage opened, fully exposed to him. Naruto immediately jerked his head away, but the damage was done. Matabi growled at the goddess, and when she got close enough to kiss him, blue flames flashed into existence on his cheekbone. She recoiled so it wouldn't burn her, but the heat would have melted her makeup. Naruto turned to her with an annoyed expression. Last warning, speak your piece, or I'm leaving. She pouted playfully, but he could tell by the spark in her eye she wasn't done, not by a long shot. You're not from this world, are you? Naruto shook his head, no, I arrived here less than a year ago. Her eyebrow quirked in curiosity, before lifting her hand to play with his hair. She really shouldn't have. Naruto suddenly felt Matabi pressure his body for control, and so he let her not sensing any malicious intent. He smirked at her winningly, and he saw a blush adorn her features. He reached forward and cupped her hand, before pushing some chakra into her. She immediately descended to his eye level, her knees weak from the feeling. Naruto leaned in close to her ear. Goodbye Aphrodite, I pray that we don't meet again. He said with a warm voice making her shiver, before slowly dragging his finger against her palm until the last possible moment, before the chakra flow was cut off, and she lost the warm and fuzzies his touch was giving her. He retreated slowly, her hands reached for him, for that feeling again, but she couldn't touch him. All her hands gripped were cold, hard, rough sands. They grated against her nails, horrifying her slightly as it seemed to just fall off of him like water. She couldn't grab him, couldn't hold him, he was leaving. Wait, Naruto. He stopped, giving her a burning hope as she reached for his face, a lustful gaze so powerful it would have threatened even a female's control over her libido. Stay. I want more of you, I want your taste. She said, her words slamming into his mind with almost terrifying force, but he was already prepared, and Matabi's rage was only getting stronger. He smiled at her, tilting his head with the kindest curve to his lips. Aphrodite felt her heart pulse, her cheeks bringing color to her face even through her makeup. His strong back, his relaxed shoulders, his large hands, but his eyes. His eyes shone with so much emotion and pity. If only you weren't so poisonous. He disintegrated into sand before her eyes, shocking her even more, and the sand slithered out, closing the door with an almost silent click. The sand suddenly columned upwards, and fell soon after, revealing Naruto in all his presence. Punk. That's your partner, right? He seemed insulted by the new apparent nickname for him, but nodded with a bit of pride. Naruto shook his head. Find another, for someone who governs love, she has no heart, take care. He said with a wave, before walking off. Ares thought about going after him, but he heard the conversation in the car. Food for thought, food for thought. As he walked away, he sent a quick question into his mindmate's rooms. Matabi, why did you make me do that? The cat giggled, for the goddess of love to be brought low by your touch alone, she has no business messing with my host, you are mine. He is my Jinchuriki Matabi, do not forget that. Karama said suddenly, his voice vibrating dangerously. Matabi pouted, but didn't remain silent. I will not allow that hussy to get her claws anywhere near Naruto. He is ours not some little bitch goddess's personal fuck toy. Naruto felt genuinely touched at her protectiveness, ah Matabi, you'll make me blush. Don't let that fool you, she is just being possessive, Gyuki sighed though his nose, and Matabi swatted at him. Ares got in and the cab drove away, Naruto turned to watch them go. Aphrodite leaned over, looking thought the rear window at him, a seductive smile in place as she winked at him. Naruto just watched her, his eyes making straight contact with hers, but they were so distant. It made her own confidence falter as he beheld her, the most beautiful woman, the goddess of beauty, with sadness. He only held pity for her. Not lust, nor love or envy, he was just saddened for her, as if she was an empty shell of a traumatized girl. She felt herself fall back, reclining against the comfy leather seats of this conjured vehicle. She felt something, that boy, she would meet him again. 
She glanced over, seeing him turn and walk away, and her own eyes glimmered with a challenge, fire and passion returning to her soul as she watched his retreating frame. Naruto stood in front of the mountains of trash a few hours later, staring at the mountains in annoyance. But he felt himself smiling a bit as he looked forward to how this would look when he was done, but the challenge, was to do it silently. It was Naruto's turn to watch. He made sure he got to watch the early morning into the day. He needed all the time he could get. Naruto created a few hundred clones, and sent them to surround the monstrous pile. He needed them to group up in pairs of two per station. He focused as he waited for the clones to get in position, and when he felt the signal burst of chakra, he flared his eyes, which flared with senjutsu power. Biju art. Terra manipulation. Naruto breathed out, before his hands blurred though several unknown hand seals, and then stopped by punching the ground with closed fists. The rest of the clones followed suit, and the result was slow, but definitely noticeable. The area flooded with energy from Naruto and the clones. The clones around the camp were shielding the others to prevent them from noticing, and were coping with the load. Naruto withdrew his fists from the earth, while his clones kept them in place. Naruto then clapped his hands together, and gave a low hum of concentration, before extending his hands out level with his waist, palms up. And then started to rise. The earth directly behind Naruto stared to lift up, rising strangely like a mountain range itself. Naruto felt a few beads of sweat coming on, but didn't bother to wipe them away. He had to focus. He could use more than the absolute minimal chakra from the biju to initiate the technique. After that, he had to depend on his own reservoir, unless he wanted to wake the campers and hunters. Naruto kept his steady hum, and the clones hummed in tune with him, though on different notes and pitches. The whole clearing was filled with a dull fizz of power, as the earth itself rose to the call. Within the space of twenty minutes, a large wall was surrounding the trash dump. It wasn't very high, but it was around twelve feet tall, made out of the earth. Naruto let his hands drop and the wall harden and cement itself into place. The rest of the clones withdrew their fists, and then hopped on top of the wall, looking determined. Naruto followed suit, hoping to his section before he executed multiple high-speed hand seals, and then ended on a strange hand sign. The backs of his palms were touching, and he had his outstretched fingers pointing at the trash like an arrow. Biju art. Terra separation. Soon, all of the piles started to steam, and not long after, they glowed red hot. The metals themselves seemed to tear themselves apart, and then the earth re-assimilated it, carrying it deep within the earth. Naruto's plan was going well, well until a particularly large pile of trash stood up. In an extremely loud screech, trash was thrown sideways, grinding against itself as a humanoid figure soon stood up, a horrendous assault of noise barging though his ears as he cupped them and screamed in pain as it tore apart his sensitive hearing. The campers woke up with a start and clutched their ears at the noise, before grabbing their weapons and heading battle ready, only to stop in shock at the massive giant of metal staring down at Naruto. Talos run zoe shouted but stopped as naruto growled at the giant blood dripping down his ears and then the sun rose blinding sunlight shone over the trash dump the trash piles had shrunk considerably and even patches of grass had started to grow as the clones continued to work the prophecy one of its lines the champion of the wild will stand at the dawn of day but the giant of bronze will stand in his way percy we have to help him Grover panicked as he grabbed the demigod's arms and charged forward, only to be stopped by Zoe and Bianca, who had their bows drawn in their faces. No, you will remain here. Zoe said coldly, though if you looked at her eyes, they seemed to twitch in Naruto's direction, resisting looking at him. Are you serious? Talia nearly screamed, that's Talos. The Talos. Okay, maybe not the real one since it's small, but still, Hephaestus made that, he can't fight that on his own. Zoe grimaced, the prophecy claimed that it would stand in his way, not ours. We can't interfere, this is his battle. I want to aid him just as you do, as much as it pains me to say it, but I do, and we can't, so stop. Talia seethed and Percy was looking at the titan, before patting Grover on the back, hey Grover, he will be okay right? I mean, he is the champion of the wild, he won't lose right? Grover just looked at him fretfully before tearing his gaze from Talos Jr. and looking at Percy. He is mortal Percy. 
He may be clear-sighted, and have amazing abilities, but he is only human, there are limits to what they can do. Doubting me already Grover. A voice shouted at them. They whipped around to see Naruto glancing at them with a grin. I thought you would have had a little more faith in me. Grover hid his face in embarrassment, and Talia shoved him aside, run you idiot. Naruto snorted, you think I could outrun it? Look at its legs. Talia didn't even get mad at the retort, you won't be able to hurt him, you're not a demigod. But I am an idiot. Naruto roared back with a grin and the intensity of a pack of lions, I will not run. Naruto then turned, and then said in a normal tone, only the hunters and Grover could hear. Do you want to see what I can do? Well, I have never been one to disappoint, not without a fight. A fast gust of wind ripped through the air, and Naruto started to glow a powerful glowing yellow orange. His pupils changed from silver to red, and his pupil transformed into a void black, his tattoo stretched across his face and his features began to glow like a light show. And then his eyes changed again. Sage mode is merging, Karama said in partial awe. So, the blessing of a god working with the incarnation of a demon. You're full of surprises, Kit. Naruto's pupils expanded like an hourglass, and the edges glowed silver. His tattoos glowed eerily red and expanded further across his body, but the most notable was the tattoos that stretched back to his mouth, where his canines grew a lava red line down the center. His chin was tattooed with a circle and dot in the center, and Karama smirked at that. What do you know? That was Senju Hashirama's Senjutsu mark, you really are the world most unpredictable knucklehead idiot. Naruto grinned at the power coursing through him, and then he let out a barbaric yop that shook the ground. Let's go. Kurama. And then Kurama's deep demonic disembodied voice echoed though the clearing. Yosh. Naruto's form exploded with a golden light, and then he started to rise. Soon, he grew even with Talos's height, and the glow vanished. Naruto was at the head of a massive golden nine-tailed fox with ritualistic tattoos stretching across his and the fox's body. And then his senjutsu joined. The tattoos coming from his forehead raced across Kurama's chakra. The tips of his tails, ears, and his claws flashed silver, and his eyes glowed a faint green with joy. The fox swelled in size till it was nearly 14 feet taller the size of Talos, looking down at him with a kitsune grin. Come here little man. Let's play. Meanwhile, Talia, Percy, Zoe, Bianca, and Grover were staring at Naruto, who was glaring down at the giant like a chew toy. Percy was the first to speak. Hey guys, and girls, what the hell is that? It is Naruto's, though he once claimed it wasn't actually his power, he assured Lady Artemis it wasn't the wilds either. It is completely unknown, and this time, it appears his, Senjutsu, state merged with it, increasing it in size, the silver is a nice touch. Talia only stared at Naruto in wonder, bathing in his strong, warm, comforting aura. It was like Apollo's butt, gentler. There wasn't a fear that she would be killed, it was complete assurance. He would succeed, and then he would come back and. No. Talia viscously shook her head, before turning back to the camp to start destroying the evidence they had been there. The others looked back at her in confusion since she was walking away, and she glared at them with a faint blush. Well, come on. We got to break down the camp. They followed her dumbly as a massive showdown was fought behind them. Naruto and Kurama growled at Talos's movements, they were so fucking loud and screechy. It's like that banshee Sakura, remember her? Hey, she is getting better. Still a fangirl, you should have let me eat her a long time ago. But then we could never use it as a joke. Hum, your spontaneous wisdom is scary to fight but I believe your constant stupidity is a more dangerous adversary. Naruto snorted, but grinned, it just felt right to banter with Kurama, he was a childhood friend after all, maybe this is what it felt like, to have real friends. Naruto grinned, and then growled again as Talos took another step forward. It sounded like someone had grabbed the rustiest, most foul and pointy fork, and is running it up an endless chalkboard, with speakers. Naruto decided that he had enough. The giant fox leapt forward suddenly, its hands smashing into Talos's with force, causing the titan to slide though the junkyard. He almost immediately regretted his decision as the screeching returned, but with a background chorus as it smashed through all the garbage piles that had yet to be assimilated. Naruto roared in excitement and exertion as he lifted Talos up by the hands, 
and then threw him over his wall and slammed him into the road with his tails that extended after him to slam him down. The pavement cracked and shattered under the weight and force, and several power lines fell, their electricity arcing across the ground. Naruto leapt over the wall himself, and landed with the grace of a feline, crouched and hissing at the downed robot as its nine tails swished around maniacally. Hey Naruto? Yashukaku? Everything alright? No. You're in the middle of a desert, fighting a creature made of metal, without me. Naruto twitched, before thinking it through. Alright Shukaku, let's try this. Don't try and take over K, your siblings are watching. Shukaku nodded gleefully, his insanity sparkling as he let out a whoop. Naruto grinned, before Kurama smiled a little and his chakra dissolved, dropping Naruto to the ground. Naruto looked to see Talos staring down at him. Naruto. What happened? Naruto turned to see the campers, all packed up and ready to go, and he grinned. Oh, you guys are done. Well, watch the show then, you're about to see a treat. You ever wonder if the sand dunes could move? They looked at him in confusion, before a strange horror stood in its place as his eyes lost their color and was replaced by a violent shade of brown and black. Well, watch and learn. Nordo cackled madly, before the desert beneath him rumbled dangerously, and it started to climb up his legs. Naruto's grin became sadistic, and then he was swallowed by the sand, and then he vanished. Gone. Everyone stared in silence at where he had been, and then a weird disembodied chuckle echoed through the desert. Sue. This is what it feels like to be without a body, but everywhere. Hum, hmhm. He, ha, ha ha ha. I like it. Let's have some fun. The desert started to rise. A massive humanoid shape appeared from the desert, and the dunes moved together to create it. As it grew, it started to tower over Talos, and when it rose to its full height, a massive tail sprouted from the human's waist. It slowly swayed about with chaotic glee, and the eyes glowed a powerful yellow, like the sun itself. It was taller than a skyscraper, it was taller than the Empire State Building. It was titanic. Talos was it? Congratulations on being the very first for me to use this form against. It's a shame you're not human so I can't see you cower, but we all can't be winners," Naruto said with a little happy titter, before his tail fell forward, slamming down on Talos like he was a rat. Just an overhead hammer blow, that literally caved in his entire body. It was as if the earth had chosen reach up and slap him. Talos shuddered, gathering what remained of his functioning parts and trying to flee, falling apart as it went. Naruto laughed, reaching forward with a hand, and the desert came alive. The sand itself spouted thousands of hands, and a sandstorm rose up around Talos. Slowing his movements and preventing him from seeing his escape, which wasn't actually happening, for as Talos broke free and frantically crawled, the sand beneath him was churning like a treadmill, slowly consuming him like a bog. He wasn't going anywhere. Naruto took a few booming steps closer, his weight crushing the sand beneath him with clouds of debris. Naruto loomed over Talos, before his hands shifted into a massive blade. It is true that mortals can't touch celestial bronze. It's why I can't fight you without entering this form, which kind if takes the fun out of it, but blame the gods, or whoever decided that mortals can't touch it. However, almost anything else can touch it, so what, pray tell, would happen, if I assaulted you with the very earth itself? Naruto's blade swished down with a screeching noise as it cut through the air. Talos stopped moving, collapsing to the ground. In two separate pieces. The desert rose up around it, and dragged the titan below, where it would slowly be broken down, and reimbursed to the earth, hey. Shukaku, stop making me crazy. Ah no fun. But admit it, it's, delightful. Shukaku said sinisterly, and Naruto sighed, before speaking again. Can you control the celestial bronze? Like if I powdered it, and mixed it with sand, could we manipulate it like Gara did with his sand? Silence. Naruto. Where is this brain coming from? It's not yours, so whose did you steal? Kukua said with mirth, and the rest of the biju laughed. Naruto blushed crimson and yelled at them. Hey. I may be stupid, but a stopped clock is right twice a day. Hey, and aren't we grateful? Gyuki said with a laughing fit, and the rest followed his example. Naruto just turned to Shukaku, who was unusually silent. So? Shukaku looked at him for a moment, before laughing and rolling around on his back like a circus ball. I don't know. Let's try. 
Naruto sighed, before reaching to the earth where Talos was buried, and started tearing off the celestial bronze pieces. After that, he wore it away with a sand grinder, and started mixing it in. Naruto summoned the new sand above the ground, and marveled at its beauty. It was like a river of bronze, but sparkling like a constellation. Mix more sand in with it, I'm not a bling king, like we saw in Los Angeles. But it's so sparkly. You can put it in your body if you want, but not on mine. You can even make a gourd, but small. Belt sized would be awesome. Why do all my hosts disagree with me? Naruto grinned, and felt Shukaku flee from his chakra coils, and Kurama took back his rightful place. Not bad kit, you managed to not kill your friends. Good to have you back Kurama. Naruto grinned as the sand body slowly laid back down, falling as if heading back to sleep. It soon smoothed over, the desert bringing his consciousness back to his own body, which it had deposited by his friends. He opened his eyes to seeing his concerned mission mates hovering over him, though Talia was the closest. Naruto smiled, and then winced at the sky. Ah, uh, it's so bright, Talia, can you ask Apollo to turn it down? He is your brother, he might listen. Why did you grab three? We are going upstream, and they are two-person canoes. I can literally walk on water. They are rapids. I can run on air. I'll return it. Percy said in colorful embarrassment, and Naruto chuckled as he watched him drag them back. Talia and Zoe came up to stand at his sides, and he smiled at them. Hey yo, is there a problem? I refuse to share a canoe with a perverted goat. Okay. Ride with Percy then. Zoe recoiled and glared at me, you expect me to ride with a man. Okay. Ride with Bianca. She frowned, then how will the boat move? Naruto rolled his eyes, well, Percy is the son of Poseidon with the badass water powers thing. Ask him, oh, and Talia? She looked up at him with nervousness evident on her face. She was the daughter of Zeus, so water travel was probably going to suffer for her. You're going with me, we'll be following them, just not in a boat. She stared at him in confusion, before sparks ran across her eyes in excitement. You mean we are going to walk on water, like before? Naruto grinned at her enthusiasm, well, maybe, depends on how fast they go. If they are slow, we can run alongside, but if not, I'm gonna have to carry you. Zoe frowned as Talia didn't actually seem adverse to the idea, if anything, she seemed overjoyed, and it bothered her. He was a man, he may be from another world, and kind, smart, and not that bad looking, but he was still a man. Why is he different? Naruto, can we talk for a moment? Zoe asked but her tone didn't offer any sort of, no, answer. Naruto recognized this and smiled, sure, what's up? She gestured down the banks, alone, if you don't mind. Naruto's hands drifted to his groin and he looked at her fearfully, you aren't going to shoot me are you? I may be tough but there is only so much I can deal with. Zoe looked frustrated and embarrassed and Percy laughed, but immediately ducked behind the counter to avoid being seen, and good timing too especially since an arrow thudded into the board right where his head used to be. Zoe lowered her bow and gestured for him to follow, only he didn't move, promise you won't shoot me? Zoe rolled her eyes, but a smile tugged at her lips, I promise not to shoot you without cause. Naruto seemed suspicious of her wording, but nodded and followed along, but he wrapped his cloak around his arms, so if he needed, he could be able to block in time. Zoe lead him down the road a bit, before turning and crossing her arms, glaring at him. Why are you so different? Naruto blinked, was I supposed to be normal? Zoe frowned, you know what I mean. Naruto shook his head, air, no, I don't. I've only been here a year and avoided human contact at all times. Zoe growled and stomped her foot, you were a female for a time weren't you? Naruto nodded, and shivered, yeah, that time really wasn't awesome. Do you guys do back strength workouts or some special stretches? Cause having that much weight on your chest just isn't fun. She blushed crimson and withdrew her bow. Naruto immediately brought his hands forward and surrendered, hoping to appease her. She seethed, but put her bow away, and Naruto sighed in relief, wondering if this was what happened to Aero Senen, every single night, but not getting away. Naruto shivered again, and Zoe looked at him strangely, but continued. You lived among the fairer sex for quite some time, even leading other lives all around the globe. You have seen other men, why are you so different? The air got cold really quick. 
Naruto stared at her, emotionless. Are you serious? I witnessed and even experienced the suffering that women are forced to endure, and you expected me to participate. Naruto hissed, his eyes flickering crimson. Zoe couldn't make herself stop shivering. Naruto stared at her hard, you are not the only one who has suffered, not even close. I am not even from this dimension, tell you what Zoe, wanna know something about the world I grew up in. She couldn't make her neck shake her head in refusal. War. That was what the whole world was about. War and killing. I grew up in a world where people trained day and night to kill. Did you know, that the average soldier had a life expectancy of 30 years? There was a war almost every week, and whether we liked it or not, we were dragged into it somehow. People died, all the time. Children were volunteering to become the next military force, starting at the age of fucking six. Zoe stared at him horrified, and Naruto stared at the pebbles by his shoes. Yeah, life sucks, I get that, and women certainly had it harder than most men all across the board, but this world, it's nothing compared to the horrors of mine. She stared at him in partial anger and sorrow, and he only stared at her eyes with a somber light. You're lucky you have Lady Artemis. Someone so angelic and powerful to protect you, someone everyone feared and respected. Yes, you and many more have suffered, but at least now you're safe, home, and loved. Naruto turned and walked away. I never got the chance, I never had anyone. And now, when I finally gained the power to be that someone, that person to protect everyone, I was taken from them. Naruto disappeared around the corner before Zoe could say anything, and she kicked herself. She didn't want this to go this way, but, regardless, she had her answer. Naruto sighed as he walked back, trying to dispel his anger with a few deep breaths. Blinking at the feeling he was being watched, he noticed Talia's and Percy's expressions, No, I'm fine, ready to go? Zoe will be out in a bit. They looked suspicious and nodded, loading into boats. Zoe came back and sat with Bianca, and Percy with Grover. Everyone stared at him expectantly, and he responded by shoving his head in the water. Naruto would have laughed, but couldn't make himself do it. Zoe really got under his skin. He revealed way more than he wanted to. He would have to make sure he silenced her before she shot her mouth off at her patron. The Olympians would figure out what he wanted before he could prepare, and he didn't want to know what they would make him do to get what he wanted. Percy came back up and was about to warn them, when water spirits appeared and shoved them forward at high speeds. Naruto sighed and grabbed Talia with a startled yelp as a response. Sorry, you can't run at that speed for, I can too. Naruto looked surprised, before shrugging and created two clones, which immediately transformed into two ankle bracelets and attached themselves around her ankles. She looked skeptically, and when she stepped on the water, her face morphed into glee. Naruto grabbed her wrist and lead her into a sprint, where she followed with some difficulty, but they were gaining on their comrades. Talia yanked her hand free, and Naruto only chuckled as she ran around, laughing as she created small ripples. She sped up and slowed, which kinda got annoying after a while, but they eventually came up with the canoes. Naruto smiled down at the naiads, and they blushed and giggled at him, to which Naruto could only grin playfully. He picked up speed a bit, and they kept in pace with them. Naruto started to laugh, before he created a clone and it picked Talia up. She gave a small cry of dismay, before Naruto grinned at her, and her complaints melted. Naruto grinned down at the naiads with a challenging wink, race ya. And then he took off so fast the water exploded beneath him. The naiads looked astonished at this, and the two grinned at each other, before one tossed her boat to the other, who pushed with both arms, and grinned at her sister. And she took off in pursuit. Naruto was running peacefully across the water's surface, until he heard the surging of water behind him. Naruto smiled as he turned and saw the quickly approaching Naiad, who was giggling as she charged at him. Naruto's heart surged with competitive fire, infecting his smile, and started picking up his pace until they were neck and neck with each other. The Naiad was giggling like a gossip girl who was just told the most popular guy at her school was just caught with having a girlfriend nobody knew about. Naruto increased his speed, and she kept pace with him. Naruto only laughed aloud and took off at a spring, leaving her in a blur. It only shocked him to see her smiling at him playfully, and then speeding up to catch him. Naruto felt like they were playing a game of tag, trying to catch the other before the race ended, it was so fun. Until she slowed down, and then Naruto slammed into a wall. 
spider web cracks sprung across the gray concrete wall, and the naiad giggled at him as she slowed to a stop next to him, laughing quietly and patting him on the back as she separated himself from his indent. Naruto looked at the wall in shock and a bloody nose, and started laughing childishly, the naiad blushed and laughed with him. It took a while for the others to catch up, though Talia looked a bit annoyed, the rest were glad the ride was over. The naiads giggled at Grover, who fell out with swirls in his eyes. The hunters had their hair blow backward, and Percy's already windblown hair was standing on end. The naiads and Naruto laughed for a few moments, and when Percy thanked them and let them go, the two sisters snuck up and kissed Naruto on both cheeks. He blushed crimson at the sudden advance, and the naiads sported a happy red tint to their own cheeks before dissolving into water. Everyone was speechless for a minute as Naruto stared at the water with a bashful look and a hand over his mouth and chin. Grover broke the silence. He was looking at Naruto with the largest puppy dog eyes he had seen in this world and crocodile tears were streaming out. No fair. Why do you always get lucky? Naruto snapped out of it, snorting at the comment with an elongated nose, turning away, it's a habit, Lady Luck owes me. Talia looked confused, she, owes you. Naruto shrugged and said nothing, though Zoe could see the conflict at the back of his eyes. He isn't telling me something. There was more to it, something worse, something darker. Zoe thought with slight trepidation. She remembered when they asked him to clarify on his origin. Zoe shook her head, you said it again, this world, what do you mean? Were you originally not? Naruto's expression darkened, yes, I am not. I haven't been in this world for more than what you call a year. And after that, Phoebe looked less than believing, where do you come from then? Hell. Naruto's lips curled into a small, cruel smile, yeah, something like that. If something worse than being raised in a world of world war was the norm, what would qualify as being hell? Naruto turned to look at what he hit, and he stared at the massive metal construct that blocked his path. The Hoover Dam, it's huge, Talia said in partial reverence. We really should have brought Annabeth, she would have been so happy to see this place. Grover muttered, and Percy laughed, yeah, and then we would never have left. Talia snorted, before looking up, how are we going to get up there? Grover jutted over to the left, I saw an unused trail a little ways back. Talia and Bianca just looked at him when Percy spoke, yeah, we aren't goats, we aren't going to make it. Grover looked affronted, you could too. No, Naruto said a grin on his face, I have a better idea. Everyone immediately stepped away from his grin, it was creepy. Naruto created a clone, and with a little effort, he threw his straight up the side. It zoomed up, before landing on the side of the building a few paces from the top. Naruto turned to them. All right, come here. What? Wait. Why? Bianca screamed as he chucked up the side, she rocketed up the dam and as she reached her zenith, the clone reached out and caught her before depositing her limp body on the ground next to the wall. Naruto turned back to the rest of his group, who were looking at him in fear. So, who's next? Some evil stares and promises of pain later, Naruto sent a burst of his chakra though them, and they all visibly calmed and relaxed. After that, they went for a small tour, indulging in some, damn, jokes, and leaving a confused Zoe to wonder what the hell was so funny. The girls left after a bit to go do whatever, and Naruto, Grover, and Percy were left standing alone, wondering various things. And then a sea cow decided to join them. Moo. What the hell? Naruto turned to the origin of the noise, and, well, wasn't sure what to think. Bessie? What are you doing here? Percy asked genuinely concerned. Bessie? Really? Naruto said sadly, and Grover just looked at him in amusement while Percy looked embarrassed. Bessie mooed at him distressfully before doing a somersault and vanishing beneath the waves. Naruto found this very bad. He may not speak, cowfish. But he knew a warning when he saw one. He worked with summoned animals himself, no way he would ignore this. Naruto immediately tensed, before looking down the damn road, and seeing two pale security guards. Their clothes flickering in and out, revealing their skeleton bodies. Naruto hauled Grover and Percy to their feet, before shoving them towards the visitor center. Find the others, I'll slow them down. Naruto. There is more than two, from the looks of it, they probably have us surrounded, Grover said nervously. Naruto turned and grinned at them, 
Don't I know it? He said with a grin, before clones appeared around him. They all looked at each other, before running in different directions. I'll stall them, but not forever. I'm not a demigod, so they will try to get past me rather than anything else. Now go. You have ten minutes. And then he charged at the skeletons. Percy and Grover ran for the doors. Just as they left, they could see Naruto colliding with the first and knocking it away like a bowling pin with a double-legged sidekick. Dynamic entry. Naruto's clones had dispelled. They were limited by what they could do in a public setting. They wouldn't follow him when he disguised himself as Percy, they ignored blows, and when they had enough, they shot his clones. It wasn't looking good. Where the hell were they, he said ten minutes damn it. Gunshots rang out, and he immediately dived backwards. Naruto sent himself though the lunch area's windows. He went skidding across the floor, and sighed, he really needed to work on that. His attention always seemed to just fucking wonder. As he stood up and brushed the glass off, he turned to see Zoe, Talia, and Bianca sitting right in front of him, unwrapped burritos ready to be eaten. He looked at them in shock, completely blown away. He gritted his teeth in annoyance, my Kami, are Percy and Grover completely useless? He whispered venomously. He turned to the girls, who were on their feet and weapons drawn. Okay. Skeletons are here, they have us surrounded. Fun fact, they can disassemble their arms and legs and use them to fuse both their arms together, creating double the power. Zoe paled, and Bianca looked at the window, is that how you got sent up to the second story? Naruto shook his head, nah, I jumped. He turned when he heard a loud bang behind him. Grover and Percy burst thought the cafeteria doors. Guys, we got trouble, they said, their words dying in their throat when they saw Naruto. I gave you guys ten minutes, what the hell were you even doing? Ran into a clear-sighted mortal. Skeletons are already inside. Naruto growled, whatever. Point is we can't kill them, so we need to run, get ready. As the demigods and company started to hastily pack up, the elevator doors dinged open, and in stepped three skeleton warriors, chattering to themselves as they wobbled towards us. Naruto grimaced, but then an idea struck him. Son Goku, need Tsunade strength or higher, gimme all you got. Haha. <laughs> My time to shine. Blow them away. Naruto ran forward, before rearing his arm back like Sakura used to do, and pushed his own chakra into the blow as Son Goku added much more. He gave a primal roar and released his now glowing red and orange fist, striking the lead skeleton in the chest. Boom. The air shockwave from the released for alone blew the walls and chairs back, cracking the floor under their feet. The skeleton had his ribcage shattered to shrapnel, his arms and legs smashed so deep into the walls they could wriggle free to heal again. Naruto screamed in pain as his arm fell limp to his side, but didn't stop, he lunged at the second, and as it swung at him, he ducked under, and heel stomped the skeleton's head in. Smashing it into the floor with a massive crash. The floor shattered like glass, and his teammates were sent flying back from the shockwave. Run. I'll catch up. Naruto shouted at them, before creating a clone and following them. Naruto turned back to the remaining skeleton, and a blue swirling ball appeared in his left hand. Congratulations Bonebag, you are to be the first to feel this family technique on this world. He said, before rushing forward. The skeleton seemed to realize the danger it was in, and started to fire at him. Naruto charged forward, the bullets colliding with his technique and dissolving like flies hitting an electric swatter powered by a nuclear power plant. He slammed the technique into the skeleton's head with a roar, and bellowed out. Rasengan. The quest members heard another boom and turned to see a wave of dirt appear in the tunnel behind them. As it settled, they saw Naruto run in, or more like hop, as his other leg was now useless as it dragged behind him. Are you serious? What are you doing? I've only got one leg and I'm still faster than you. Are you really children of the gods? Naruto said in outrage, before hopping past them with astounding speed. Talia growled at his insinuation and followed him. The others soon following suit. They made it back to the ground floor, and saw a black security van pull up at high speeds, almost crushing a few old people under it. Three skeletons hopped out, and Naruto snarled, before roaring like a bear and punching the ground with his good hand. The ground cracked under the blow, and the skeletons stumbled. Naruto backhanded the group behind him to keep running, and he followed them. He created several clones, shadowing them as he went. Kukua. 
How's the healing going? Well, this had to happen eventually, this would be the next stage in growing accustomed to us if you wanted to live. Letting your body grow adapted to our power is your only hope of prolonging your life. If I die I die, how's the healing? Don't get snippy. She chastised, honestly, she was such a mom, it's going remarkably well. Lucky you I was prepared for this. Your arm and leg will be up and running in a few minutes. Naruto nodded, before feeling out his arms and leg, noticing he could move and use them, it just hurt like a mega bitch. Great. Pretty soon, they were surrounded in a semicircle, keeping us from fleeing. Shit. Naruto cursed, before turning to his clones, who were taking bullets for their teammates, dispelling at a terrifying pace. Chome, can I use your wings? No, you won't be able to carry everyone. Your clones can't make wings. Naruto growled in annoyance, thanking Chome and closing his eyes, he needed to focus. Talia. Pray to your dad. Percy suddenly said. Talia looked annoyed by this. No, he never answers. Just try. No, he will answer this time. Says who? Athena, I think. Talia glared at him, before closing her eyes and moving her lips in a silent prayer. Percy joined her, and Grover looked hopeful. And nothing happened. Naruto sighed, the Olympians were not doing themselves any favors. Naruto sighed, before turning to Zoe, hey, if I don't wake up after this, leave. I will find you again, don't worry about it. Naruto, Talia said, whatever you're thinking, it's a great idea, yeah I know, he said with a cheeky grin, before flexing his arm forcing his body to move. He ran forward, before stopping and taking a deep breath, making sure he had all the skeleton's attention. Hey Karama, you know, we have never done a full body transformation. I've always had your avatar, but you have hardly ever had a chance to come out and play around have you? Naruto said to himself, thought Zoe and Grover heard it, and remembered the name from the battle with Talos. Do you want to try that now? Naruto grinned, ah come on, I had to catch up to Octopops eventually, and that day is today. Karama grinned, before they both clapped their hands together in unison. All right Kit. Let's go. Naruto grinned, before turning to the others, his eyes swapping for their crimson counterparts. Hey guys, run the first chance you'll get. They won't follow, trust me. Naruto. Whatever it is don't you dare, Biju art. Naruto whispered into the air, before his body burst with chakra, his blue-green twirling in harmony with crimson red and a golden yellow. Unison. He said to the wind, and he exploded outward with chakra. His team was blasted backwards to the gold angel statues, and they watched in horror as Naruto's form started to ripple, before he hunched over, and exploded outward. In his place, was a massive nine-tailed fox, in the flesh. It was a sunburnt orange, with massive long ears, fangs the size of cars, and eyes the size of humans. The creature hissed out a roar, swinging its tails around for the fear factor. The skeletons were rattling in their bones form the vibrations the creature was making, and the waves of power it exuded were terrifying. So, you're the pests my Jinchuriki has been dealing with, the fox said with a deep, malicious voice. It was so close to fear itself it could only be described as demonic. So tiny, it said, before crushing a skeleton to dust under its massive finger, and then letting out a terrifying screech of fear at the remaining skeletons. Unkillable. Ha! Huh. Let's test that. The fox then went about demolishing the skeletons, smashing them to dust, before watching in fascination as they reconstructed themselves. They tried to shoot him, bludgeon him, stab him, hell, even tried to strangle him, but nothing worked. As they fought, or more like played in the fox's case, the golden angels approached the other quest members, and brought them under their protective wing. After some haggling, a few useless taunts and Talia throwing her weight around, the angels agreed to take them away. Except when they told them the giant fox was their friend. It was at that point the angels seemed to notice the giant demonic fox, and hurriedly grabbed the kids, before taking flight and leaving him behind. Wait. Talia screamed, but the angels ignored her, intent on saving their charges and taking them west, heading for San Francisco, their destination. Naruto. San Francisco. Percy shouted back, hoping those giant ears weren't worthless. The fox's head tilted in their direction, before he rose up to full height and ran after them. It shook the earth beneath its feet, 
and trees and roads were obliterated in every sense to the massive craters that were its footprints. It gave a bone chilling roar, before it leapt at them, and as it ascended in the air, it began to shrink, condense, and it seemed to shed all its fur. As it ascended in the air towards them, the last of it fell away and dispersed to reveal Naruto, unconscious and badly bruised. His whole body was practically a bruise actually. If you didn't know him before, you would have probably guessed that was his skin color from the constant shade his body was. And then he reached his climax, three feet from them. Talia gave a scream of dismay, and without thinking, Percy jumped after him. Zoe quickly loosed an arrow after him, shooting though his pant leg and anchoring on his belt. It was a miracle he wasn't harmed. He grabbed Naruto and prayed his comrades were enough to hold the both of them. The rope held as Grover exerted his amazing physical prowess and dug his furry hind legs into the chinks in the angel's clothes. The hunters were right at the end with Talia in the middle, holding the rope taut as they prevented their comrades from falling. Pull me up! Percy screamed, and Talia felt like launching a quip at who was afraid of heights now, but refrained, and stared to hoist the duo up. After a few tugs, a few close calls, and a screaming Percy, they managed to haul the two up. Naruto was immediately brought on top safely. Everyone had a hand on him as they situated his unconscious body. What the hell is that boy? The angel said in dismay, he can't be human. Celestial bronze passes right through him like a regular mortal, Zoe said, studying Naruto in a new light. What, are we doubting him now? Talia said in outrage. Zoe just stared at her. Surely you're curious, that power isn't human, and yet here he is, in a human body. Have you seen his body? It's a giant fucking bruise. But why? Maybe he doesn't want to say. You heard that creature, it called him a, um, Jin. Jin. Jinchuriki? Zoe frowned, Jinchuriki, the power of human sacrifice. That was a chilling thought. Sacrifice? Percy repeated, like he was just hit with a concussion grenade. He said he was raised in hell. Bianca remembered, maybe, he really was. That fox certainly sounded demonic. Humans, you never change. Everyone flinched and jerked their heads to the source of the voice. It was Naruto, maybe. Naruto's eyes were open, but the crimson eyes were different somehow, they were the same as before, but the malice and danger it held was nearly 100 times more potent. He sacrificed his body and possibly years off his life to save you, and you're concerned about what he is then the fact that you wouldn't be alive otherwise, you disgust me. They looked at him in shock as the bruises all across his body started to heal, the swelling decreased, and his muscle mass began to repair itself and even grow. The brat is too generous, saving such worthless meat bags at the price of his life, I will never understand that. The voice grumbled, and yet, he does it anyway, what an idiot. Talia and the rest were only staring at him speechless. Naruto? Naruto turned to face her, no maggot, I am not Naruto. Zoe stepped forward, who are you? Naruto turned to her, his crimson eyes glowing, Zoe Nightshade, if you weren't under the kit's protection, I would kill you on the spot flinch. He has done nothing but protect you, aid you, entertain you, hell, he even fed you, and you still doubt him. I repaired and healed his testicles myself, and if I had my way I would have butchered you and left your carcass to the ravens. She had the decency to look ashamed, but not for long, he is a male, he is not trustworthy. Humans are untrustworthy you ungrateful wretch. I've been around for more than four times your lifespan. Do not dare to presume to know what I know. My partner has been scorned, tortured, and mentally destroyed by your cursed race. My only regret is I didn't kill the lot of you when I had the chance. The voice seethed, barely on the edge of physical rage. Red energy raced over his skin, enhancing his feral features. As he was about to lash out, a warm, kind blue and green energy reached out, and wrapped the red energy, before absorbing it and preventing it from harming anything. The voice snorted, even now, unconscious, beat until he can't move, and suffering, he protects you. Humans, you never change. The voice smoldered, before looking at the sky, its crimson red eyes slowly dimming. Humans, and you call us monsters, and then the presence vanished. Even the angels were speechless as the presence left, leaving Naruto's unconscious body to heal, which was looking pretty good actually. Percy took some water from his bottled stash he always kept and ran it over Naruto's arms and legs, frowning. What is it? 
Talia asked uncertainly, still concerned about the whole demonic voice thing. His bones, there are more fractures than actual solid substance. He said with a frown, and his muscles, Jesus, I'm not even going to say. He said with concern. I don't have enough water here to even begin to heal him. He really tore himself apart doing that, whatever. Biju Art, Unison, Grover muttered. Everyone looked at him, and he looked nervous. That was what he said before, you know. Biju Art, huh? Everyone looked to Zoe, who was also contemplating. What the hell are you, Naruto, where you guys wanna land? Asked a bronze angel, a smile on his face for some reason. Hum, there. By the Embarcadero building. Zoe pointed to the angel as she climbed onto his shoulder. Good call. Me and Frank can blend in with the pigeons, an angel said, before beginning their descent, despite the ludicrous looks on their riders' faces. The small group touched down in the early morning, with only a small amount of people up and about. They scared a homeless man pretty bad, but that was the only mortal that noticed them, so silver lining. They hauled Naruto's now almost fully healed body off the angel's back. His massive bruises were all but gone, and his bones were once again whole. The last evidence of his injury was a faint bruise line on his throat. The group handled him gently, even the hunters, and when they reached the ground, they cleared a small space and let him down gently. That sat around him for a few minutes, watching as the last of his bruises disappeared, and when he was perfectly healed. Nothing happened. They stared at his unconscious body for a few more moments, before turning to Zoe. So, what do we do princess? Talia said in curiosity. Zoe didn't even retort at the nickname and looked over the area, we can't afford to stay here. We have three children of the big three with us, the longer we stay here, more likely we are attacked. We only have until tomorrow before the solstice, so all due haste is required. They all nodded in understanding, before looking down at their unconscious teammate. The old man of the sea, that's him. Zoe nodded at Percy, yes, that is Nerus. Why is he homeless? I don't know, but don't ask him, you only get one question. Huh? Zoe and Percy stood at the edge of the docks, staring at an aged old homeless man chilling by the ocean waters. He was dirty, disheveled, and his eyes seemed to stare forward with a permanent angry expression. He was fat, he had a large white grubby beard, but became yellow over time. Zoe and company decided that he needed a proper disguise, so walking a little ways away, breaking a few locks, and stealing some merchandise. Percy was dressed for the part. He was in a ragged flannel shirt several sizes too big with an extra large pair of torn jeans and shoes that looked like scraps of cloth with rubbed on the bottom. And you know what she said when she was done? A typical teenage male vagrant. What even is a vagrant? Percy hobbled forward, stumbling every few steps. Other homeless people saw him move on, and didn't pay him any mind. Percy stumbled past a few more groups, smelling each one. He wasn't sure why, but the fragrant weapons seemed to invade his nostrils like America did on the beach of Normandy. He kept moving, hobbling forward and once he got onto the pair, he started to mentally prepare himself for the battle up ahead, he moved behind the old man, and before he could do anything however, the old man turned to him. Beat it Seabrat. Percy looked visibly shocked at that, and Nerus glowered. I can smell the sea on you, you're that upstart son aren't you? Well fuck off. I'm not doing any favors for Barnacle Beard's son. Percy shook his head, I'm sorry, I think, but I need information, I'm on a quest to get lost. Nerus bellowed, before standing up and glaring at the boy. Percy stared at the man, before glaring back. I'm not leaving until I get what I want. Nerus growled, before launching forward, surprising Percy. He figured Nerus would have tried to run, not fight him. Percy tried to fight, but the old man was surprisingly strong for his age. His grip was like iron as they grappled, and Percy was quickly losing strength. He tried to drag the old man into the water but Nerus only roared in rage and threw him back onto the docks. Do you think I am a fool? I know your father you blasted son of the sea god, I will take your life here and now. He screamed, before lunging forward, pulling out a bone knife from the back of his ratty pants. Percy paled at this and the sea answered to his call. It rose from the shore and attacked Nerus in a sweeping wave. As it hit, Nerus shrunk down into a lightning quick fish before he swam through the violent wave and landed back on the docks in his human form. 
Ocean water clung to him like a wet robe as he shook his yellow beard and charged Percy again. I will kill you! He screamed in rage. Percy rolled back and reached into his pocket for Riptide to defend himself, but Nehru suddenly threw his weapon at him, flying at high speeds. Time seemed to turn sluggish as Percy tried to draw his sword in time to block the attack. He realized in horror as he started to move out of the way as it came closer. I'm not going to make it. Percy managed to jerk to the side in time, missing his torso, however, the dagger dug deep into this sword arm, forcing him to drop his uncapped pen and to stumble backwards. He made a jump for the sea, but Nerus changed again. He gave out a battle cry as he all of a sudden expanded into a massive killer whale, on the dock. With a grunt, he swung his tail like a club, batting Percy's bleeding form away from his father's domain, and sending him careening onto the docks farther back. He transformed back to his human form again, breathing in deeply before grinning like a madman and advancing on Percy. Percy was rattling for breath as his now broken body was moving towards the ocean. Nehru stepped onto the boy's back and picked up his bone knife. I hope you can see this Poseidon. Watch and never forget how I slew your favorite son. Nehru bellowed in rage, before driving his dagger downwards with an impressive amount of force. A blur streaked across the docks, cracking the wooden boards beneath its feet, before colliding with Nerus with a boom and the crack of bones. Nerus screamed in pain as he fell back. The blur stood up, and revealed itself to be a blonde in a white cloak. Naruto stumbled a bit to regain his balance. Nothing better than another human for a brake pad huh? Kurama laughed in his mind, and Naruto did his best to ignore it as he shuffled over to Percy and picked him up, before examining his wounds and looking at Percy's bleeding face. Dude, who told you fighting an eon-old being that hates you and your father's guts, alone, was a good idea? What the hell were any of you thinking? Percy would have replied, but Naruto took a running start forward, before throwing Percy's body into the sea. Naruto turned to Nerus, who was just making it to his feet and grunting in pain as he pulled his own knife out of his stomach. He probably landed on it in the moment, trying to cushion his fall. Naruto remembered all the jokes at the academy about falling over and landing on your own kanai, he didn't actually think it was possible until now. Naruto squared his shoulders and faced Nerus with a serious gaze. Hello, I have a question, but you don't want to answer it huh? Nerus glared at him, demigods, you're all the same. You, wait, I don't smell divine blood in you, who are you? Naruto grinned at him winningly, finally. Someone who actually believes I'm mortal. Man. This is awesome. I thought I was going to have to end up going to Olympus to explain to everyone that I don't have a godly parent. So glad. Naruto said with clasped hands and crocodile tears. Nerus just stared at Naruto in disbelief, before pointing his bloodied dagger at the blonde and glaring. Leave. Naruto cocked his head to the side. Ah oh, come on, I'm trying to save a goddess here. You know, Artemis. Goddess of the hunt, maidenhood, and the moon. You do realize that if she doesn't come back before the solstice, the gods are going to be in uproar. Just try and guess who'll be in the top five of people being interrogated, repeatedly. Nerus twitched, and Naruto stared at him, childishness gone. He wasn't the blonde idiot anymore, he was a World War veteran, an assassin, a man forged from years of bloodshed. Nerus seemed to recognize the change. I will just have to hide. The gods are not almighty. There are places I can hide that would be away from their eyes," he said smugly, before flicking his blade at Naruto, beat it brat. Naruto grimaced, I don't want to do this, but I need to. He said, and then in a blur of speed, he appeared behind Nerus, who whirled around in surprise at the mortal's speed. Naruto kicked the backs of his legs in, causing the fat man to fall to his knees. Naruto slammed his neck with a downward elbow, forcing his head to rock. He kicked out with his leg to knock the knife from his hand. As it was falling, a clone popped into existence and appeared in front of the old man, knife point at his throat. I'm sorry, but I can't be released from my mission until she returns. Please surrender, I don't want to harm you. Nehru seethed under his own knife's point, all right brat, you win. Naruto smiled and nodded. The clone rose from his crouch and grinned, before handing the blade back to the old man of the sea. He gave a playful salute, and then puffed into smoke, his presence vanishing. Nerus watched the smoke vanish with a grimace, before turning to Naruto with a glare. One question per capture, approach seeker, and ask. 
Naruto flinched, remembering the oracle said almost that exact same thing. He opened his mouth to speak, but Percy shot from the water, landing on the dock, fully healed and ready to rumble. He pulled out his pen, and extended it into its sword. He settled into a defensive stance, glaring forward. And then seemed to realize what was happening. He stood there for a second, before wordlessly capping his sword and shoving his hands in his massive baggy pants pockets. Naruto just stared at him, before turning back to Nerus, who was glaring pointedly at the boy. Naruto sighed and snapped his fingers to regain his attention. Hey, question time, ready? Nerus glared at Naruto, but nodded, your question? Naruto opened his mouth again, but then froze. I could ask how to get home. Naruto choked on his words, he could get home right here, he could find the way. What should he do? He could, but he couldn't, but he could, but he can't. Kit. Naruto shivered suddenly, before turning to Percy, who had the other questers gathered around him checking for injuries. Hey. You guys ask the question. Everyone looked to him in confusion, but it looked like only one of them understood. Grover walked up and put a hand on his shoulder, smiling sadly. Hey man. Thanks for this, I'm an empath, I can sense emotions from almost all living things, I can almost hearing your emotions screaming at you. Thanks. Naruto interrupted with a big smile on his face. I'll be by the road, come on back when you're done yeah? Grover nodded sadly, and everyone else watched him leave in confusion. Naruto swiftly walked around the corner of a building out of their sight, before slamming his fist into a wall. There was a dull thud followed by snapping. Naruto slammed a fist into the wall, spider web cracks streaking out like lightning as his head hung on his shoulders, a dark aura around him. Kit, it's okay, we will find another way. Kurama said neutrally, though on the inside he was concerned. An emotional Naruto was a dangerous Naruto. Shukaku seemed to be enjoying the emotional waves, and Matabi was comfortingly stroking Naruto's coils with her chakra. Her warmth soothing him like a hug. Naruto let out a shaky breath and had some sand from the small ground on the back of his waist to fill in the cracks. He sighed to himself and pressed his back against the wall, before sliding down and splaying his legs outward. He closed his eyes, and when he opened them again, he was in front of Kurama. Kurama. What should I do? Our plan is slow, and my meetings with the Olympians are fleeting, can we really? Tell me Naruto. When did you give up hope? Naruto snapped his head up, eyes burning. I have never given up. You know that. Then what has changed? Why are you here, sniveling like a boy with a scrapped knee? Grow up. Things change. The tides of life are unprecedented, incoordinated, and fluid. They will always seek to pull you under. I know that. Then why are you here? Because I can't loose you guys. Naruto screamed out, making the water ripple underneath him. Kurama stood there, waiting. Naruto took shaky breaths, trying to get a hold over himself, but he kept cracking. Every kami damned moment in this place I could lose you, all of you, I comma I hate that, you're the only precious people I have left, I can't, I can't. I have to protect you, Naruto shouted, tears sprouting from his eyes, and now that I finally have a chance, I can't take it. Kurama stood there in silence, staring at the boy beneath him. He hated seeing the boy like this, a sniveling mess of despair. Are you done? Naruto snapped up to look at Kurama, he opened his mouth, but he stopped when he saw the other biju wandering in, gathering around him in a massive circle. He watched as they all stood on their haunches around him, staring at him with concern and affection. Naruto was speechless as he felt comfort wrap around him, it was soothing. We know the risks Naruto, and we aren't going anywhere. Isobu said evenly. Do you doubt our power? From your little spat with Ares, even Shukaku is above them in strength, Son Goku said with a thump of his chest. We will not die Naruto, we are here, and we don't plan on leaving for the higher plane to see our father just yet. Kukua said with a serene confidence. You may be a little larva, but together, with all of us, we have nothing to fear. Chome said with an upbeat tone. Yes. No undying flesh sack will end our EXISTANCE, Shukaku said menacingly. Everyone stared at him for a moment, before pretending he didn't say a thing. Your compassion and strength aren't to be underestimated. Your hope alone is enough to light the way. Gyuki said sagely. Nothing will happen. If any woman so much as tries I will burn them, Matabi said angrily. 
blink. Child, you aren't alone here. Don't ever doubt it. Seikon said in a cheerful voice. Naruto swiveled his head around to watch them all, and then he looked down, a tear sparkling as it fell to the rippling water under him. Geez, I must have looked really pathetic huh? He said under a mop of hair. Is the kitten embarrassed? Matabi said playfully, before rubbing her flaming check against his back. Naruto chuckled, before raising his fist in the air. He felt contact, and then the weight build as each biju laid a hand on top of each other's. Naruto finally looked up, smiling like a newborn son. All right. No more tears. Even if it takes years, I will return you home. The biju chuckled at him, before nodding. Yes, now go, your teammates are in trouble. Naruto nodded, before closing his eyes and vanishing from the cave. As he left, all the biju suddenly turned somber. Now, we have another problem. They looked at each other, before turning behind them, and seeing larger, more dangerous cracks appearing in the tunnels. We need to find a way to keep him alive, and fast. Naruto blinked his eyes open to the real world, before slipping into the shadows and creeping around. Voices that weren't his friends were speaking, and he didn't like the tone they were taking. He crept across the docks, before grinning as he reached the beach. Hey, Shukaku? What's up? Ya yeah, no, I've got a bunch of people that need to die, wanna help? Shukaku gasped. Ah, you shouldn't have. Naruto grinned, placing both hands on the sand and letting Shukaku push his influence through. It was hard to keep it suppressed, but Naruto kept a lid on it. He couldn't wait to see their surprised expressions. Maybe Shukaku really was rubbing off on him. Surely it's clear, a strange man said, this is your moment. This is why Lord Kronos brought you back to life. You will sacrifice the Afiatoris. You will bring its entrails to the sacred fire on the mountain. You will gain unlimited power, and on your 16th birthday, you will overthrow Olympus. Everyone in their group paled. A man Naruto didn't recognize who was standing in front of them, armed guards behind the mystery man. Expressions of realization and fear crossed their faces as they tried to not look at Talia. Everyone was afraid of her choice, though Percy looked slightly, relieved. He turned to Talia, probably wondering what she was doing. Talia was hesitating, she is baffled. There was a power struggle going on in her brain, and Grover could sense it. You know it's the right choice, the man said with a comforting tone, your friend Luke recognized it. You shall be reunited with him. You shall rule this world together under the auspices of the Titans. Your father abandoned you Talia, he cares nothing for you. And now you shall gain power that surpasses his entirely. Crush the Olympians underfoot. Like they deserve. It will come to you. Use your spear. Talia. Percy shouted suddenly, snap out of it. She only stared at him, unable to think clearly. She looked like she had just fallen out of her tree all over again. But, I come I don't. And then Hell came up to say hello. Sand exploded from underneath the wooden boards. It surged upwards with a force, with vengeance, and quickly entombed everyone. The mortal guards raised their weapons to shoot them group, but Zoe loosed some arrows that let loose a yellow cloud that nearly made her allies fall over from the stench. It raised its captives above the ground and packed itself so tight only their eyes could move. I leave for a few minutes, just a few minutes. A voice sighed loudly. The demigods turned in surprise to see Naruto standing in the beach below them, grinning at them. Hey guys. That weird guy was kind of annoying, he wasn't helping was he? Naruto said cheekily, before the sand beneath him hardened and lifted him into the air like a personal elevator. Hey! Why is the cow here? I thought it was. And then he got shot in the back. There was a loud crack of a rifle, before Naruto fell forward, and the sand beneath him crumbled. He landed with a thud on the sandy ground, hacking up a good lung off blood. Damn it! Disrupted my concentration. The half-bloods wanted to comment on that, but decided now wasn't the time. The sand fell away, and the guards rushed forward after the manticore shouted, Get them! Percy summoned a large wall of water from the sea and sent it careening forward and sweeping the enemies back. Another loud rifle crack was heard, and Percy was punched backwards, but unharmed. Thanks to his Nemean lion skin, he regained his feet quickly, shielding Naruto as Talia rushed forward with the added protection of her shield and dragged him out of the sniper's line of fire. They retreated further down the pier, taking cover behind some tourist kiosks that dispensed useless trinkets. Naruto sat up, 
coughing, and after a few chest pumps, he hacked up a bullet. He examined it closely, before chucking it behind him. I knew they traveled fast, but I didn't think they would be that fast. I'll have to pay extra attention. Percy, flee. Head to the sea and ask Poseidon for help, hide the bane. No. I'm not leaving you guys, Naruto snorted, it's not like we can go with you. I may have some control over water, but that doesn't mean I can breathe under it. At best I can hibernate for maybe a few hours, but that's it. Percy looked annoyed, and then despair crept across his features. Camp. He shouted, we need to tell them. Naruto looked at him, yeah, that would be why we need you to jump, are you not listening? Percy stood up, before slashing an old water fountain, and slicing a hole in the kiosk for a weird crystal. Nice Percy. Here, Drachma. Grover said, tossing him a coin before grabbing his pipes to play. Only for them to thrown into the sea by a bullet. Grover shouted in anger with a bald fist, Oi! I like those. His anger seemed to light a fire in his eyes, and for a moment, it reminded Naruto of Lee, until another bullet ricocheted against the kiosk with a ping, and sent Grover back under cover with a whimper. Naruto noticed Percy was talking to a face in the rainbow, and that was weird, but he decided that the enemies were more important. He closed his eyes and placed his hands on his knees. He needed to concentrate for this. Chome. I'm here, what does the little larva need? She said cheekily, and Naruto sighed at the name. He knew it was because Matabi called him kitten, and Kurama called him kit, but still, a larva. I need wings. Are we ready to yet? Chomei seemed to grin as she took the stage, fully extending all seven wings and glowing a powerful yellow. Well find out. Naruto grimaced and grunted thought he pain as his back was remodeled to house wings. His shirt started to tear and eventually completely came off as purple-red dragonfly wings sprouted from his back. His wings extended, before stretching out and fanning themselves. Naruto tried not to grin at the feeling, he needed to focus. He felt out for his wings, and listened to Chomei's instructions as he went. He couldn't afford to mess up, even with his durability, falling from great height unprepared would not be good. He heard Percy's gasps, before turning to Mr. D in the weird rainbow thing and say, never mind, we aren't going to die, please go back to being useless. He was so in trouble for that later, it was great. Naruto then pushed off from his spot at lightning speed, the bullets chasing his afterimage. He shot into the morning sky with a purpose and listened to the adrenaline shout at him that the bullets were this close to hitting him. He let out an ecstatic yop as he continued to ascend, before taking shelter in the air with the clouds and surveyed below, staring down at the scene. And then he dived. Naruto hadn't felt so alive since taking on an army of Zetsu clones by himself. He broke the sound barrier and ignored his bleeding ears as he slowly pulled up, level with the sea. The water beneath him exploded in bubbles as the wall of air he is pushing through it into chaos. He would admit later that he didn't really see much detail. Only one thing remained in his memory besides the feeling. The manticore's stupid expression when he coated his hands in fortified chakra from Chomei and Isobu, and at sound-breaking speeds, flew straight into the manticore's stomach. He immediately exploded into dust, leaving only a few knives as spoils of war. Naruto continued flying, before ascending again to avoid buildings and hoping he would slow down with gravity's help. Percy and Zoe dealt with the rest, while Talia shielded them with Aegis. Naruto slowly pulled to a stop above an extremely tall building, before running down the side, retracting his wings. They hurt real badly, and he wondered if he damaged them somehow. Baka, you just used muscles you have never used before, it would be like doing a few hundred push-ups without any shinobi or even physical training. Naruto almost tripped at that, but nodded in understanding. He charged down to the bottom, before using his chakra to slow down and eventually come to a stop on the sidewalks. He noticed it was surprisingly empty. And then he heard the sirens. Oh yeah, there was a gunfight with an illegal gun squad and snipers. That probably wouldn't be legal in the city zone would it? Naruto ran back to his group, though his back hurt really badly, he decided that he would have to practice. I'm surprised though, the only reason your wings didn't fail mid-flight is because of your almost mythical stamina. Even Fu fell from the sky a few times. Haha. <laughs> I knew it. I'm awesome, of course. That was after she stayed in the air for several hours, and lifting heavy objects. Naruto's celebrations were cut in half, before coughing into his hands, 
and then shocking them in his pockets. He leaned forward and plastered on an indifferent look, and snorted. H.N. Don't you dare copy the Uchiha, Karama bellowed, and all the biju laughed at their antics. Naruto made his way back to the group, seeing all the enemy soldiers restrained by large grape vines, and most of them were dead, shot to death given the holes in their corpses. Naruto looked to Grover, I didn't know you could do that. This is the thanks I get. Demigods, a familiar voice snorted. Naruto turned to Dionysus, the god of wine, and snorted right back, Well, as I keep saying, I'm not a demigod. Whatever Nanamo. Whatever Mr. G, Dionysus seed, it's D, D as in. Oh yeah. Well, later diabetes. A a a a a a a a a a Dionysus was cut off as the rainbow disappeared. Everyone looked at Naruto, waiting for him to turn into a dolphin, and nothing happened. Hey guys. A voice called. They all looked over to see Bianca, running towards them. She stopped in front of Zoe, there is a massive presence on the top of the mount. I don't know what it is, but it's so strong it's overriding anything else I can sense. Zoe nodded in understanding, seemingly expecting it. Naruto turned to everyone, well, now that we got rid of that, let's go free a goddess shall we? Never done that before. Percy shook his head, we can't leave him, he is their target after all he said, scratching the cow from earlier. Naruto frowned, that was a problem. Well, we can't travel by beach. If we are headed for a mountain, it's counterproductive, Naruto said blandly. Well, it can appear in different bodies of water, can't Grover tell it to go back to, I don't know, somewhere other than here? Zoe asked, stringing her bowstring trying to calm her nerves, she knew something, and it wasn't being shared. Naruto eyes her for a moment, before turning back to Grover, who looked uncertain. I come I can go too. I'm the only one who can talk to him, I can show him the way. Percy, can you ask your dad for help? Zoe turned to Bianca, you go as well. Huh? The hunters are no doubt restless. Your presence will keep them from causing any unjust damage. Naruto grinned, actually, they have tried to leave multiple times already. Zoe looked at me in shock. What? Naruto nodded, yep. 11 in total. They never got past my clones though. She sighed and rubbed her forehead. I'm sorry you have to continually expend energy to keep them safe. Naruto nodded but smiled, it's my mission. I accepted this, so it only falls to me, no need to apologize. She nodded before turning to Zoe, more the reason to send you. Naruto watched the two talk, before giving Percy a nod and gesturing him to the ocean. Percy looked doubtful, but shrugged. He pushed Talia to do it, and he wasn't a hypocrite. He walked to the water's edge, and muttered a prayer. If Zeus could do it, Poseidon sure as hell should. Poseidon, Dad, help us. Get the Afiataraus, Bianca and Grover safely to camp. Protect them at sea. That's a pricey prayer, got a sacrifice? Talia asked. Percy looked thoughtful for a moment, before a light bulb went off in his brain. He turned to the ocean, removing his coat. Grover looked weary, hey Percy, you sure? That lion skin, it's really useful, even Hercules used it. Percy had to coat hanging in his hand. He was thinking about the cloak. It was extremely valuable. It was even bulletproof. It could shield him from all harm. His life as a demigod was bound to get rough, this would protect him. Give him a chance to protect dozens of more lives. Percy's eyes flicked back to Zoe, who was studying him carefully. He remembered his dream, of how she aided him, gave him everything, and he cast her aside. He had always admired him, someone he aspired to be, but he didn't want that. He didn't want to do that, and yet. He couldn't let go. He tried to force his fingers apart, but they wouldn't obey. Maybe, he took out his pen, his trusty sword, maybe, what was better, a shield to protect, or a sword to destroy all those that would harm. And then a hand on his shoulder had him look over. Naruto was standing there, with a solemn look on his face. Percy, what should I do? Percy asked, his eyes furrowed as he stared at his items again. Go for a swim. W-H-A-A-A-A. Hey. Naruto's look immediately morphed into a trickster's grin and shoved the demigod directly into the ocean. There was an ocean breeze, and the offering was accepted. Well, don't keep him waiting Grover, Bianca, get moving. Naruto said with a grin and he only got a strange look in return, 
before nodding with a smile. Yeah, I'll keep Bessie safe, so don't worry, go get Artemis. Bianca nodded, save my lady. Naruto grinned, tell Nico I said hello, and that I'm coming back soon. Kid probably wants another tour of the sky. The satyr and hunter descended under the waves, and Percy used the water to plop him back down. Percy seemed almost relieved that he didn't have to choose, and so let it pass without comment. Naruto nodded in recognition of this, and started walking off. Well, we got a goddess to save don't we? Never saved a goddess before, this will definitely be a first. They all just stared at him blankly as he walked off with a small hop in his step and a hum in his throat. We'll be coming around the mountain, to be continued. Remember to subscribe and like this video. See you in the next part.